Welcome, everyone, to Dotless Fingers, episode 145, Band. I'm Scad, and with me, as always, is my buddy, Matt. Yeah, hey, Scad. Hey, everybody. Uh, we've got an exciting episode today covering chapters 39, which is called Enough Rope, through uh, chapter 45, which is an interlude. We're finally getting back to an interlude, Scad. It's been a while. A um, that one's called Some Tavern Tale. So check it out if you haven't read them yet. Chapters 39 to 45. Read along with us. Uh, in these chapters, Quoth doesn't back down from bullies. That's not something we've seen from him before, huh? Uh, but he feels the consequences this time and also some consequences of his own actions, including being banned from the very place he wants most to be. That's right. Yeah, it's... uh. An interesting, interesting time for Quoth as he tries to find his footing here at the university, right? He's been there only a very short time. Yeah. And uh, learning what it's like to break rules at a place where rules matter, um, not the the rough and tumble streets of Tarbine. Mm-hmm. Uh, a quick Patreon announcement. So, frankly, patrons, July was hard. July has been a mess. It's been Just a busy, busy, month, for a busy your, month for your intrepid hosts yes. here. That's right. So we've punted our our uh, our next content to August. We are really excited about that content. Still, some work being done to finalize exactly how it's going to work. But it will be a roast. It will be a roast of a teeth grinding, uh, middle middle child uh, that we all know and love. And exactly how that format happens and uh, and how we get our roasts uh, going is still being worked on. But expect some of you to hear from us over the coming over the coming weeks. <laughs> hook placed yep uh that's, that's really our only announcement right yeah yeah we don't we don't have uh you know summer's going i got vacation coming up i just got back from one and you know some some birthdays too i got a couple birthdays coming up Jeez, it's just summertime time. baby yeah um have you seen the new indiana jones film i did see it yeah, yeah. me too did you like it i did yeah i don't you know, uh, go ahead. Let, let me say, I like it as much as I like most of the other Indiana Jones films, probably maybe a little bit less, but, uh, but, you know, it's the same with star Wars for me. Almost every single one of the star Wars films, there's stuff I don't like in it. Right. Mm-hmm. Except for yeah. empire strikes back, which is utterly perfect. Uh, same thing with Indiana Jones. There's stuff I don't like, but for the most part, I thought it was great. I thought it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much the same. I mean, I, I, I'm in a place now where I'm, I'm pretty hard on movies, Matt. You are. Um, like I, you know, like I don't go see many anymore in the theater, and been on a little, on a little kick of going back, getting back into it, maybe. But I, you know, I don't want, I don't want just to be entertained. I want there to be some, some meat to it usually. And I'm not making that claim with this movie, but for whatever reason, I was able to just let my guard down a little bit and just enjoy it. And I did Mm -hmm. like, I, like I just, I I really just enjoyed the film. It was fun. I had fun watching the film. Were there problems? Like you said, yes, but I, I had fun. Yeah. And it was really fun. Yeah. I wanted more like archeology span stuff. Like I love it. The Raiders scene, right? The opening Raiders scene, which is the best, one of the best movie scenes ever. Yeah. Uh, And I wanted more of that. I felt like we got very little of that. A lot of car chases, a lot of train mm-hmm. fights. That stuff's yes. great too. But yeah. I love it when Indy's in his element, you know? Yes. Yeah, agreed. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I liked all the history stuff though. I mean, we got a lot. I feel like, you know, I mean, there's always history stuff, but I feel like we got more, less archaeological history and more like actual history. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that was, that was interesting with the battles, you know, the, they're talking about the battle that, Anyway, we won't spoil everything, but yeah, I I really enjoyed it. I had fun. Okay, cool. Uh, the, but, it wasn't uh, it wasn't in our plan to talk about this, Calisar. No. It just kind of I just asked. No, no, we we could have figured it if we thought about it. Um, yeah. but you know what? I, I I don't think we've talked since I saw uh across the Spider Verse either. Ooh, haven't and seen it. That is a fantastic film. Yeah, I've, I loved it. I haven't heard anybody say anything less. Yeah, it's really good. So I, it's 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 uh, it's like a work of art. Yeah, in in a movie, 
like the drawing styles and the contrasting. Anyway, it's hard to explain. If you saw it, you know what I'm talking about. But uh, I definitely recommend that one. We got on a couple, the list, baby. We got a couple spider heads, you know, in our house, and plus my sister and everything. So it's been on the list for a long time. But yeah, that's a priority. Yeah. Well, should we should we dive into it? You know, we are uh, we are an A Song of Ice and Fire podcast covering uh, <laughs> King, the King Killer Chronicle, so we should probably get back onto our main topic. Yeah, and, and currently covering whatever movies we feel like talking about. <laughs> uh, Casablanca is... Uh, okay, uh, we are spoiler-free for King Killer Chronicle until the end of the podcast for a special segment we call Devi After Dark, so we will not be spoiling in the main uh, sections of this coverage. We'll not be spoiling future stuff in these books. Uh, so we'll warn you when that uh, Debbie After Dark section is coming and uh, you can jump off if you don't want to be spoiled. Yeah, and we'd love to hear from you, from you alls, uh, especially as I know there are at least a couple people who have mentioned to us that they're reading these books for the first time along with us because mm-hmm. we are covering them, which is super cool. Uh, very gratifying. So we'd love to hear how your experience is going with the books, what you think of it so far. So please reach out to us. You know where to find us, Davos Fingers. Um, our email address is wearedavosfingers at gmail.com, Twitter at Davos Fingers. We're on Facebook, and you can learn about our Patreon program at patreon.com slash Davos Fingers. Um, we got the blue sky thing too, right? We do. I, I'm I'm hesitant to to promote it because you can't really get on it unless you have an invitation yeah and so we're on it uh i you know we've got a couple invite codes that i've sent out uh it's exciting to see people joining and we'll see where it goes it's still you know it's still early days for that thing to me but i it's promising but... i don't even have an invite code i haven't sought one out so I... <laughs> no well i don't have i'm not on there personally either i got yeah. our davos fingers account on there but yeah i don't i almost sent those codes to us so that we could be on there personally uh, but I was like, yeah, let's get more of SR on there. Yeah, we'll see. We'll anyway. see. That's how I am with all these new little pop-up <laughs> yes, social media yeah. sites. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. It's a healthy way to think about them. Um, <clears throat> you know, you you just mentioned, uh, you know, some people were reading along or reading these books for the first time and only picking them up because we're covering it and stuff. And I just want to say how thankful I am for that. You know, Matt, I'm I'm getting older. I'm going through a little bit of a midlife crisis, maybe. Uh, I struggle with value sometimes, you know. For sure. I um, feel that, brother. But even even just knowing that, you know, some people are getting to read these books, you know, at small some small way because, you know, because we've decided to cover them is, it's really uplifting to me. Like, it's it's an it's enough to make that small difference to somebody, you know. That is, it really helps people get through the day sometimes knowing they're making an impact like that. So thank you guys for reading, for following along. It means a lot to Matt and I, you know, those, those that do. So, um, so be sure to tell us that you like them because if you hate (laughs) it, then that's, (laughs) that's true. That's true. (laughs) I'm just kidding. Scad. Well said, well said, buddy. Yeah. You're going to drive me into a, into a death spiral. (laughs) If you tell me that it's awful. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. All right. Let's start with chapter 39. Enough rope. Uh, as we, (laughs) As we may remember, Quoth sat, sat through the first class of Professor Hem's class, the principles of sympathy, and knew everything that Hem covered. This was in the last episode that we talked through. I'm just reminding you because go right into the next thing here. He also knew that this class was going to be a colossal waste of his time. So much so that at the end of that class, he approached Hem uh, to tell him as much. This is going to be a waste of my time. Hem put him off and said they could talk before class the next day about Quoth's situation. So fast forward now, here we are to this chapter. That's all well and good that they can talk before class if it happens. But what we have in this chapter is him handing the class over to Quoth for instruction without any warning. Hem thinking he can give Quoth just enough rope to hang himself. The only problem for him is that he's dealing with someone who isn't bluffing. Quoth is happy to oblige. He does know this stuff. He knows the material. He's a trained stage performer. He mounts the stage, surveys the available materials he's got to work with, and delivers on Hem's request to give today's lecture. He asks an assistant to gather one of Hem's hairs. He lights a brazier uh, uh, while he begins on the meat of the lesson, which are the three laws of sympathy, correspondence, consanguinity, and conservation. To demonstrate, he makes a wax doll, calling it Master Hem and getting a little laugh from the class. 
He applies the hair he was given to increase the likeness between the doll and the teacher. He holds the doll over the flame of the candle, and there's no effect. As Hem is about to stand up to declare victory, victory, Quoth swoops back in, indicating there's no impact because not enough of the heat is getting through. But they can enhance the amount that gets through with proper binding to link the candle to the brazier and Hem to the doll. Holding it over the flame again, Hem yelps. Both teasingly threatens to throw the whole doll in the brazier to see what would happen, and Hem grabs the class back, fuming and shaking Quoth's hand quickly. Uh, upon leaving the stage, Quoth departs the classroom as well entirely without looking back. And that is the end of this chapter. One of my favorites, I admit. A lot of great exits in this block of chapters. Have you noticed <laughs> okay. that? Well, I should I say a lot. There's at least two, and at this is two. one of them. He okay. just walks out of the class. Well, yes. Mike, can... drop out of the class, stoic as can be. I can think of at least one more just off the top of my head in this cha- in these chapters. So yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Um, yeah, a, a fun, ch- a kind of a fun chapter. Um, you know, you get it's 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 the fun part of this, right? There may be consequences to what he's doing here, and we'll we'll get into that after the next chapter. But uh, you betcha. I mean, Quoth is kind of a genius. It's he's foolish too, right? Making this moppet, he could have used sympathy against someone else. You know, to to put this challenge away, you know, or, or done it, you know, a little bit less less violently. He's so new to the university that he doesn't really even know that it's wrong to do this kind of stuff, right? To each other, um, but he should have, you know, maybe thought about it. Um, yeah. You know, and he doesn't back down from a challenge ever. This is this is one of his flaws, and I think he's in his telling of this story, he's pretty honest about that flaw, right? He's not going to back down from bullies and challenges ever. Good point. He's not, you know, and not only does he not back down, but he hits to cripple every he time. the stakes. Yeah. Right. Remember what he did to the bully in Tarbine. Yeah. Not only did he burn down the guy's house, he, he okay. took what was, yeah, his shelter, <laughs> his living yeah. space. Yes. He took everything that was important to him, right? He stole the picture of the kid's mom or whatever it was who we think yeah. is implied that it's his mom. He goes for the kill Drank every his time. Yeah. yeah. Burned, every, <laughs> burned everything to the ground. Yeah. Like that's just what he does. And we forget that he's only been here now. Uh, I mean, a uh, week ago, yeah. a week ago, he was on those mean streets. Yeah. Doing that. Living that life. Yeah, it's a it's it's hard to just turn those instincts off, right? right? Where it's kill or be killed essentially on the streets of Tarbine to I'm being challenged for you know everything I hold dear here. Well, no, you're not. Like it's not your life this time. They're just gonna make you sit through a course. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's you know, just like, a class, man. It's just you just you know, sometimes you gotta go through English 101 because your AP credit didn't transfer, you know, like right, just, yeah, just just do just take the class man just take the class what was the science that you had to take freshman year in college like, i don't remember what it's no, called no, no, no. science or something like that just like the really basic science class yeah it's just it's that class but yeah. no but um you know uh, as i was reading this block of chapters i went and reviewed um uh Kvothe's original sympathy lesson with abenthi oh, clear yeah. back at the beginning and with the iron it, drabs and it caused this to stick out to me when he looks in the drawer, when Quoth looks in the drawer on the, on the lecture stage, right. Yep. And he finds the, the candles and everything. What else does he find? A few oddly shaped blocks of metal. Mm. Couldn't he have used those to demonstrate <laughs> sympathy in the same way that Abanthi demonstrated sympathy to him the very first time? Like maybe yeah, not, but yeah. maybe so like, in other words, did he have to make the voodoo doll out of the candle wax? Yeah. Probably not. But this is an example again of Quoth hitting to hurt. You hit me, okay, I'm gonna hit you back yeah. such that you don't hit me again. But here the, the rules are different here at the university. Yeah. Hem can hit back and he can hit a lot harder. So it, it's also, I mean, you're a performer, you know, you know what it's like to uh when you get on the stage, you're like, all right, I'm gonna give him a show. I'm, yeah. I'm feeling I'm feeling the I'm feeling the crowd. Uh-huh. I'm into it. They're into it. Let's let's do this thing. Like let's let's make this let's make this impactful and memorable, right? Right. No, that's and, true. 
And, you know, this is, we'll, we'll get later, you know, the Chronicler says, you know, this is, this is a story they're still telling about you, mm -hmm. right, at, at the university, about this class that you gave, right? And there's different versions of it, and the legend grows in the telling and everything, but, you know, he, he did it. I don't, I, I, we'll talk about this too later more, but like, I don't know that he knows he's doing all these things to have the effect on his, on his overarching kind of legend story. I don't think he's oh, intending to do yeah. it, mm -hmm. but, but the fact that he is the type to always raise the stakes and swing for the fences and aim to punish and hurt, it lends his stories to be outrageous and, and, you know, retellable and entertaining. And yeah. So it, it, he's just got this combination of qualities that kind of lends to being a legend. And one of them is he's going to do crazy shit like this, right? And not think about it. Mm -hmm. It just comes naturally. That's his, you know, that's combined with his, his performance upbringing. Yeah. Give him a good show. So you're invited back to the town the next time you come through, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So totally. It, 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 yeah. It, it's ingrained in him, right? I have mm -hmm. to give a good show. I have to give him a good performance. Right. If I do the iron drabs, it won't stick. Yeah. He probably even somewhat perversely feels like it's a little bit his responsibility to actually teach these students the laws correctly. Right. I've <laughs> got to make sure that they get this. It's my job while I'm up here. Because Hem's not going <laughs> to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he, so he, he says something uh, a very telling about his personality of I realized I could grow to enjoy this. He thinks to himself as he's on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, it's in the paragraph where he says, I paused and listened to the sound of a half hundred pens scratching down my words. And then beside me, ba Basil is uh, working at the bellows, as Quoth had directed. I could grow to enjoy this. Mm -hmm. He likes this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And he likes being the authority. Well, yeah. I mean, there's so much. That, that came to me in the last half hour as I was kind of getting ready for this, uh, that, that I jotted down that Quoth could do anything with his life, right? Aventhe even says it to, to his parents all those chapters ago where he says, whatever he chooses to pursue, he's going to be a legend, right? He could do almost anything, right? And, you know, you wonder if he didn't get distracted by the Chandrian. Maybe he could have been the best professor ever. Maybe he could have unlocked secrets of the universe of you know varying kinds but instead he's got this distraction this we'll get there but this stone door and mm -hmm. and the things related to it right um yeah he could have been he could have been probably totally happy being a professor and you know yeah and, yeah uh, a lot of professors you you may be um Maybe you saw it at school too. I, I know I certainly did. Um, there's a healthy dose of ego there, right? Oh, they, yeah. They like being the ones in authority. And it doesn't take away from the fact that they are good professors and they're good teachers. And they they do care probably about their students yeah. learning as well. But they like being that authority figure yeah. and yeah. Um, authority in the sense of knowledge, right? I know this, you don't. So... I'm up here. You're out there. Yes. And then there were those that, that didn't care very much about students and all they wanted to do was pay for their research. Right. And yep. they were bad teachers. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, we might've talked about that before. I had Absolutely. a guy that like, he just, he wanted to go to Bali. Like he wrote about other cultures. He was an anthropologist and he uh -huh. wanted like, he's like, well, I do this so that I can go to Bali and learn more about that culture and write books. And, you just kind of stumble through a lecture. Yeah, I don't care really about being here necessarily, but you know, pays they pay for my trips to Bali if I do it, <laughs> you know, for my research. So I had one who was who was an archaeologist and he 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 taught a New Testament class. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And he was this old guy, but yeah. in the summers he would go to Egypt and yeah. he would work on burial sites and stuff yeah. like that. And uh -huh. And so his classes were never about the New Testament. Just, <laughs> when I was exploring the pyramid of da -da 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 -da. <laughs> Exactly. Super interesting. Learn nothing about the New Testament. Yeah. 
can I find a single word in this New Testament chapter we're supposed to be talking about <laughs> that I can thrust in myself into one of my own stories? Yeah. Which, which listeners, I went to Brigham Young University in which one of the requirements is, you know, it's a, it's a school that's run by the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. You have to take a religion class every semester. On your schedule, there has to be a religion class. So, yeah, that was the New over Testament. Over and over again, that New Testament one sounds kind of fun. <laughs> Maybe it would have been a good idea. <laughs> Uh, anyways, we don't, need, we don't need to talk about the laws too much. Um, but super I, interesting though. And nice to have the review. I felt like I yeah. understood it better coming from quoth than I did from Abinthe. Yeah. Uh, make it similar, make a connection. If you can using part of something to represent a whole of something else. Uh, and the energy one should sound familiar. It's essentially the first law of thermodynamics right. Right? <laughs> energy matter. can't be created or destroyed. Right. It's right. Yeah. It can just be modified. So, um, yeah, interesting, interesting little little reminder. Good, mm-hmm. good to hear it. Um, and we'll get, you know, I think we get more of that going forward some too. The magic that Quoth isn't impressed by, remember? Remember? He's like, when he learned about the drabs, he's like, yeah, I guess this is cool. It's like, you're he like makes stuff. it work. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, this is fine. It's like, oh, whatever. It's not real magic. It's just uh-huh. like, moving stuff yep 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 uh um, i don't have a whole lot else in this chapter you got any, anything more uh no hem is awful yes um just He'd an awful, an awful professor he would be <laughs> just sitting there with his face turning red <laughs> purple yeah, and... <laughs> yeah. i'm so mad right yeah. now and just you know no idea he's being played like, no you know, my career is in adult education, right? And um, he's actually got one part kind of right is when a, a student is already well-versed in the subject matter that you are trying to teach, you recruit them to help you teach that topic. And that's how you keep them engaged in some way. Yes. Um, so he actually got that part kind of right. But like accidentally for the wrong motive. But for the wrong reason, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to yeah. humiliate him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So I like, mean, okay, it's the right idea, him. But I think he doesn't really believe that he does know this stuff, right? No, he doesn't. Not at all. So I think, not at all. But but yeah, had he had he believed him, would he have given him the chance? I don't know. Probably not. And but. that's there's so many real world connections and illusions made by Rothfuss in this whole book, mm. and we're going to see more. But this is a perfect example of a university that is hallowed and revered and respected, but when you get down to it, is kind of an old boys club, right? If this school really cared as much as it did about its students and all of that stuff, no way would him be teaching these classes. He's just awful. Yeah. Just not yeah. cool at all. Yeah. Um, so it was interesting to see that. And yeah, we talked about, about that. that and a lot of other institutions we talked about that little a little bit in the in the last episode right it's like there's so many stodgy rules of you know keeping those in power in power and not really accepting the new students in and making sure they succeed you know we're about to well we'll get there but we're about to see one of the students whipped like this is not you know this is, this is not a good you know welcoming place this mm-hmm. is a, a place of punishments and rules and do as I say, not as I do, and all sorts of other stuff. And right? making money. And money. Yeah. Making money. The answer to 999 out of 100 questions, Matt. Money. Money. Uh, I think that's what I got. All right. Oh, let's brother. move on to 40. Okay. This one's called On the Horns. You know, as the story of his lecture spread... A part of Quoth naturally enjoyed the accompanying fame that comes with, you know, publicly humiliating a master, especially one as unliked by the general student body as Hem. On the other hand, Master Hem is one of the mass nine masters, and making an enemy of him may not be the smartest of moves, Quoth. Um, his friends weren't helping, warning him over dinner that harmful sympathy, good band name, called it, 
okay. falls within the definition of malfeasance. Maybe also a good band name, like a death metal band name, malfeasance, mm. right? Uh, you know, an expulsion for malfeasance, even after just two days of, of school, of class, uh, is not out of the question. Um, later on, Quoth is indeed called to appear before all nine masters, and they were sitting around a crescent-shaped table, and he's standing in the middle of that. Ah, so that's what the students whisperingly, re- whisperingly refer to as being a- on the horns. Get it? The crescent shape here in the middle. Mm-hmm. Got it. Yeah. Uh, two charges are formally presented against Quoth as brought forth by Master Hem. First, unauthorized use of sympathy leading to injury. And second, malfeasance. Both carry a penalty of lashings. Yes, that's right. Physical abuse. And the one for malfeasance carries with it even the potential for expulsion from the university. Uh, Upon being asked, Master Hem recommends five lashings for the first charge and eight for the second. Ouch. And here, Quoth, recalling Abanthi's admonishments to always be prepared to defend himself and his ideas, calls upon the heart of stone and calmly claps back. He had been given both express and implicit permission to perform sympathy when Hem directed him to give the day's lecture. Isn't that how he's supposed to teach? By giving a demonstration? And with the materials he had on hand, the best he could do, he claims, was the wax doll. He had no idea the fire would be as hot as it was. No way should the binding have been that powerful. Um, Quoth claims that rather meekly. Puts on a calm, meek face for all of this. The council actually concurs and both grievances are stricken. Boom, removed. A new charge takes their place, however, that of reckless use of sympathy. Uh, For that, Master Hem seeks three lashings and he refers to the blisters on his feet. (laughs) The vote to discipline Quoth was such Passes just barely by a single vote, and it's decided. He'll be whipped tomorrow at noon in the public square. Uh, Rather than meekly lying down and taking the L, Quoth goes for the W. The punishment he accepts. But during his admittance interview, just days before, um, it was said that he could be admitted to the Arcanum if he could demonstrate that he had mastered the principles of sympathy. Does this little episode constitute the required proof, he asks? Uh, with the support of masters like Kilvin and Elodin, the majority agrees that yes, it does. And the motion to admit Quoth into the Arcanum passes. Wow. We'll talk more about that. Um Later that night, Quoth moves his belongings to the Arcanum bunks, where he's not received quite as warmly. Um, Most students have to work several terms towards being admitted to the Arcanum, so Quoth understands their feelings of jealousy. Can't really blame him. He picks a bed in the corner, far from everyone else, and he settles in. And that's how the chapter ends. This is another great chapter. Uh, it's a good one. It's a good one. Uh, you <laughs> you ever had one of those, Matt, where you did something that felt good? It felt right and justified. And then like minutes or hours pass and like the slow dread creeps up in you and you're like, oh, no. Am I, am I in trouble? Did oh, I? Oh, no. Did I ever do did I overdo that? Am I am I about to get called by you know my boss or my spouse or did I just it felt so right but I I shouldn't have done that. It happened to me just the other day, man. <laughs> I think I talked about it on Twitter where I kind of lost it in a hockey game. Uh very much for the right reasons. Yes, a homophobic slur was leveled yes. towards one of our teammates, and yes, I absolutely went ballistic on the referee, and uh, the referee gave me 
a, a pretty significant penalty for the me going ballistic on him, mm-hmm. um, which which was right of him to do. Uh, but it hit me as I was sitting in the penalty box. Oh my goodness. Did I just do something right morally? I think so. But I just put our team down one player mm-hmm. with 30 seconds left in the game mm-hmm. and we're up by a single goal. Mm-hmm. What have I done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's that moment of, yeah. oh, crap. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I could have waited until after the game to drag the ref, right? <laughs> Still do the action, maybe take it a different way. Uh yeah, I mean that's a hard that's a hard one to second guess too much because you you were so ethically correct, but but also yeah timing yeah. And as I came back to the bench, you know, we ended up preserving the lead and the team we won and everything. I say we they pres- my teammates preserved the lead and we won the game, um, yeah. and they were so supportive of me when I came off the ice. It was totally fine. But yeah. there is that moment of oh what have I done? Yeah. What oh crap, but. Uh, yeah, this was a little bit different situation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that I, feeling of dread. You described that really well. I get it. Just it. Settles I, into your stomach. <laughs> I've had a lot of them like through work recently because I'll i my work is going through a lot of changes and I don't I don't really hold my tongue very well. Hmm. What? Uh, yeah. What? Uh, Co-host of eight years? I've never noticed that. <laughs> so, yeah, I just, I say things that I shouldn't probably say. And it it hasn't bit me yet, at least not in an obvious way. I mean, maybe I'm being passed over for promotions and stuff, who knows. Hmm. But, uh, but I keep, when I do it, I'm like, ah, shouldn't have, I just shouldn't have said that part. Mm-hmm. I'm right. But I, you know, I probably shouldn't have done that. Right. Yeah. How much trouble am I in? <laughs> so, so far, you know, none. But hey, he's still employed. For the nonce. Yeah. <laughs> you were there before me and you're still there after me, pal. Yeah. Well, it says something. I don't know what it says, but it says something. <laughs> uh, but one of my favorite things is when he's still, before he goes on the horns, he's, he's in with uh, his friends at, at dinner, kind of trying to figure out whether he's in trouble or not. And uh, and they they kind of come after him for doing. He's like he's like he started it. Mm-hmm. It's just a nice little reminder from Pat that this is still just a young boy. He is a kid. Yeah, he started yeah. it. Yep. Yeah. And as we discussed before, Kvothe is going to finish it. He has been conditioned to finish yeah. it. Yep. Um, and what we learn here, like I said in the discuss in the last chapter, is something that's a little different. Being in this university setting is you can think you finished it, but when it's one of the nine masters, they can finish it and they yes. can finish you. They can. Yeah. Yeah. But um, he, you know, you know, he, he works, he works through this to like turn it into a, into a benefit. I mean, being whipped sounds awful, but I think, I feel like both would take that trade. A million times and twice on Sunday, right? Absolutely. Every day. So, that's a that was a bad phrase. Every day of the week and twice on Sunday, not a million times and twice on Sunday, because that makes the you add those up enough times. And it's a, and it's million. a million and two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So is the Arcanum Arcanum, however you pronounce it, is that the equivalent of like declaring a major? Or would it be the equivalent of like grad school? Or is it something just, uh, com- or am I trying too hard to make these connections? No, I think it's a good question. I don't really know. It feels if, I mean, we know that one thing it gets you, I assume it gets you some things, right? Um, it gets you, we know it gets you a better room at Muse, right? You're, you're elevated. Um, we know that it gets you access to different places in the, you know, in the library, right? And you're um, studying a more specific path at that point, right? You're kind of expected well, to. I don't know because as um, you know, I don't want to spoil too far ahead. We do have a one conversation that happens in one of these yeah. chapters coming up that they're saying you got to wait till that. Mm-hmm. They're saying you got to pick, you know, who you're, who you're going to sponsor your wagon to, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like you still, so probably you will pick a focus 
but that's more related to becoming Raylar. Right. Which he's still in Elair here, right? He's still at the lowest level of even when he gets into the academy, he's still in Elair, right? And so it's a it it almost seems it, it, it gets you seem, on the path though. Yeah, it almost seems like they they grant you more trust and more resources, but you're still you're still the level, you're still at the level you're at. It's mm-hmm. a little weird. It's it's strange. I tried to find a relationship between like you know, getting the mark of Raylar, Raylar, you know, and and being admitted to the Arcanum, or like whether that unlocks being able to study sympathy or, 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 or naming or something. And I couldn't, and maybe spend long enough, but I didn't see any direct relationship to being in the Arcanum and it meaning anything for. Okay, now you study this, right, right, but yeah. Right. <sighs> Let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. If Master Lauren hadn't yeah. proactively brought up the new charge <laughs> of reckless use of sympathy, yeah. which come on, man, really? You're going to bring yeah. that up now? Yeah. I have the note too. It says, would, what a dick. This was about Kvothe, to be thrown out. Would Kvothe have gotten off scot free, do you think? Yeah, it feels, it feels maybe that way. Hem feels defeated um uh yeah it says <laughs> it would fall into reckless use of sympathy but you know right before that him uh kind of sounds defeated he says i expected him to have more control over what he was doing you know but like <laughs> that's kind of like a defeated uh, yeah like, like that's like uh, well fine but he should have known better you know, like I expected him to have more. No, you didn't. You didn't yeah. expect him to know anything. You were out yeah. to humiliate him. Yeah. I mean, Hem feels defeated and, you know, somewhat mentally constipated. It doesn't feel like he's going to mount the new charge. And Lauren sure. just jumps right in. Which is <laughs> Actually. Like, yeah. What a dick. Come yeah. On, Lauren. Yeah. I think he would have gotten off. But then on the other hand, would Kvothe have felt motivated to bring up the you know, go for that W it's a good uh, question. about, you know, so can I get into the arcanum with this? Like, yeah. Do, right. Just to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you I just don't know did... if he would have brought it up. He may have gone, okay, I just won. I'm scot-free. Yeah. I'm going to back out here slowly before they yeah. can change their mind. It It's almost like he gave them enough room in this chapter, right? By, by convicting him of reckless use of sympathy, they're mm-hmm. admitting he's demonstrated sympathy. So it's like, how can they? Good point. How could they not say like, oh, okay, well, yeah, I guess you do know sympathy. Reckless yeah. use of sympathy. Yeah. Use of sympathy. Yeah. Me. How, ooh, how about this for the band name? Sympathetic malfeasance. Ooh, I like that. Mm-hmm. Mm. It's like, uh, it's got a little bit of like opposites going. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a good one. That could be a good album name too. Mm. That's true. Sympathetic malfeasance. Yeah. These songs are going to kick your ass. Yeah. But we sympathize with you about that. <laughs> we sympathize <laughs> with how it all feels. <laughs> oh. So there's a little moment, and I don't know whether it's nothing, but I just wanted to bring it up real quick. Okay. Yeah. Um, we actually had a moment in a previous chapter uh, during, I think it's when he's getting going through admissions, where the chancellor seems distracted by something it's like he's he's answering the questions and going through the history and doing whatever you know whatever questions they're asking and it says that seems to cover most of academia the chancellor said almost to himself i had the impression that something had unsettled him and it, it reading that at the time i was like what is what is that what in, what unsettled the chancellor what's making him worried now and then in this chapter he has something where he says all eight masters accounted for. He's like, wait, no, not eight, nine. Mm, nine. Nine. nine there's that. nine of us. Right? Did that it, it I make this point sometimes, right? About authors. I'm like, they don't do things by accident. Right. Like, like he he didn't have to write that. He could just said, okay, we're all nine here. Like he made a point to have him make this mistake. And so I'm wondering if it jumped out at you or meant anything to you. Definitely jumped out to me. Doesn't mean yeah. anything to me yet. Yeah. Yeah. 
we'll, we'll talk maybe a little bit more about it in, in Debbie After Dark. But I think um, so. But it it feel it feels weird, and I'll just I'll I'll say this one more thing. It's not really a spoiler, but maybe a supposition. We count when he's counting these votes. The 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 different masters are voting, you know, two and four or four and against close charges, and there's you know there's nine of them. That's an odd number. So you know one one side's going to win, right? Yeah. But the chancellor's vote is worth one and a half. One and a half. As if there was a time, maybe recently, maybe very recently, where it was eight. eight. Mm -hmm. right and um and so they they gave him one and a half to you know to to be a tiebreaker yeah right Mm -hmm. and then that's just something they kept and never got rid of um anyway i I just thought it was thought it was interesting you know yeah so that maybe there were eight masters at some point right i like that supposition yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. how long ago i wonder yeah yeah, you know, we'll talk about that mm-hmm. later in the book, maybe. Yeah, um, but uh, do, do you find it interesting that the offended party gets to seek the number of lashes before guilt is measured? Like, like, let's say, so Hem seeks what was it, five lashes or whatever the first time? Yeah, and then he, mm-hmm. um, then three. And he could, and he could have gone up to like eleven or something on that first one. I can't remember the numbers exactly, but he could have gone much higher, right? And it's like he's weighing, like, okay, how much will they let me hurt this kid before they turn their yeses to nos, right? And yeah, I mean, like it, the number you pick might determine how people vote, not whether actually he's guilty or not, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, guilt should be established, like he did or didn't. Yeah, it's like uh, our system why, of law in the United States is you're found guilty first and yeah. then you are sentenced, right? Right. And we even have those, um, you know, neither of us are lawyers, but we even have those kind of, it could be up to this much punishment, but it could be as little as this much punishment. And it's up to, you know, the judge to determine, right, or or whatever, uh, what the punishment will be afterward. Um, but they determine guilt first. Because Correct. here it seems like if he had sought eleven, Kilburn for sure is just being like, "Nope, I'm not gonna let you kill this <laughs> kid pass. with a whip." Right? You know, yeah. like I, if, I feel like the you know the the meat of the of the punishment has a lot to do with how people might vote. Right. Yeah. Not, so but... it's another politic game where Hem has to consider, like yeah. you said, how many can I get away with, whether he's guilty or not. Yeah. Well, they say. Well, you know, five's not that bad compared to eleven. So, right. yeah, we'll let him. Yeah, I mean, he it's, does have blisters on his feet. He, he does, does have blisters halfway to his knee. Halfway I, to <laughs> his knee. That's like a sock. Yeah. He can't wear socks. Yeah, or you know, where my kid wears his socks, you know, it's half of a sock because he wears them almost all the way up to his knee. All the way up sometimes. to his knee. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't hate it. It's just interesting. It 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 puts that your kid wears knee socks <laughs> up to. No, I'm just kidding. No, he's following in my footsteps there. You do wear no, high socks. I, I do. Yeah. I do wear high socks. Yeah. Uh, no, the uh, yeah the, the 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 seeking the the lashes number before right before sentencing determining before it's, determining guilt. It's yeah. just interesting, and I you know it started my brain spinning on like whether that comes back to you know malfeasance out in the world and you know Arcanus getting you know burned at the stake or things you know things like that where they have to make these punishments very real. And so maybe they don't really let the number of lashes affect their vote. Guilt is like, guilt. You'd like to think that way. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. You'd like to think that way. Okay. I don't have too much more, you know. Uh, as what? No defense? It... Oh, yeah. Remember the inscription in Quoth's book. That he gets from Abanthi. Defend yourself well at the university. Make me proud. Be wary of folly. Remember your father's song. Then be wary of folly. Yes. So he's uh, that what no defense kind of jars jars Quoth into defending himself. Mm-hmm. Um, and it made me wonder if maybe Ben was long ago either a master or a friend 
of of Chancellor Herman, right? That this is a phrase that they use together, right? In their uh-huh. little philosophical talks. What? No defense, right? It just kind of I have nothing nothing behind it, but I wonder. Yeah. Or whether it's just a common phrase. And he knows, know. like, okay, I can see this kid even at 11 years old. He's gonna need this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Defend yeah, yourself true. well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're gonna get yourself into some binds, kiddo. I could see it now. But what? No defense? Uh, yep. Yeah, I don't. I don't have much else. So, uh, as Sim says, is it Simmons that says to him, uh, "Congratulations, I'm sorry." Yes. <laughs> Should yeah. I buy you a beer or a bandage? Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. It's a great uh, album title to the Gin Blossoms record. Congratulations, I'm sorry. Which I think oh, okay. we've talked about before. I'm a Gin Blossoms fan. I, I, uh, you know, I had the single for uh, "Follow You Down," and uh, that's something. And they had a good one on the flip side too. I can't remember which one was now. They, they're you know, they're ones. a great band that makes these poppy melodies. They've got just singable, catchy yes. choruses and everything. Yep. But the subject matter can get a little dark and it's a little gritty. Like when you listen to the mm. lyrics, like that's kind of gritty stuff. Um, but it's sung in such a happy, poppy way. And yes. I love that. I've told you my before, my favorite songs are sad songs that sound happy. Yes. And Gin Blossoms are great at that. Yes. Yeah. Check them out, kids. If you haven't listened to Jim Blossoms. Found out about you, maybe was the other half. That's a good song. Maybe. If that's the other one, that's a good song. My buddy Dan and I would like try to sing the harmonies about like because there's Ooh, they got great harmonies. That band has great harmonies. Yeah. Neither of us can sing those, so it didn't work for us. Well. Well, Need some practice. It was was still fun. Mm -hmm. Uh okay. Friends Blood. Friends Blood, this is you. Foth sits on a stone bench awaiting the noon hour in which he will be whipped. Will approaches and sits with him to console him with friendship. Willem shows him where to go after being whipped to get tended to by the Medica. They then wander the university with Willem pointing out some of the more important buildings, brothels, taverns, laundry locations. And then they find an apothecary. Uh, Do you know much herb lore? Quoth asks. Will doesn't. And Quoth asks him to go buy some null route from the apothecary, explaining, "Uh, it's to settle my stomach. Quoth buys them a round of cider that he uses to wash down the null route. Uh, Will departs to go, uh, I'm going to go with Null Root. Null Root. Will departs to go to class, confessing that he can't really bear to see his friend's blood. He had done the friend's job, getting quote through the hours before the trial, but he couldn't watch his new friend be hurt and bleed. Hundreds of people have gathered to watch Quoth be whipped. He is stoic. He carries himself with no fear or regret. M was there, smug. Quoth smiled at him broadly to give him no satisfaction. Quoth takes his shirt off to allow direct contact by the whip in order to preserve a perfectly good shirt. I have a waste of shirt on this. <laughs> Love it. He refuses to be tied to the rung, guaranteeing the overseer that he won't fall nor make a sound. He's whipped, and I'll avoid much of the detail here, but he's whipped thrice, as promised, a single-headed whip ripping into him and tearing his flesh. When it is over, he sets his feet on the bench, gathers his shirt and cloak, lays them carefully over his arms, and walks away from the courtyard completely ignoring the crowd. Which is perhaps the uh, other departure you were talking about. Yeah. His next exit stoically walks away. Yeah. And that's uh, that's the end of that chapter. Okay. Willem. What a great guy. Yeah. He acts like it's, oh, hey, how you doing? No. No. Will showed up to show up. Yeah. He was there to be there for his friend in that moment. And I love that for him. And I love him for it. Yeah. Willem described as uh, having the slightly awkward look of a boy who wasn't quite used to being man-sized yet, which is <laughs> a fantastic description. Mm-hmm. Um, he's still a boy, but he looks like a man, but he doesn't know how to move like a man yet or behave maybe completely that way. Uh, yeah. Remember that the, again, he's been here for like five days and already you know, something about both inspires this level of care and friendship from people. I don't know, right, you know yeah. what it is, but they've they've latched onto him very quickly and care, right, about him. Um, it's interesting for sure. Yeah, and yeah. I'm just going to be here for you, man. I'm yeah, hold space with you. Yeah, they're him and Simon are they're ride or die, man. They they they're all in, and it's mm-hmm. yeah, it's it's so nice. Two of my favorite characters in the whole series, Will and Sam. 
I do love how he describes it as then because I had nothing to do before my whipping at noon, I strolled the university aimlessly. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, Uh, I wonder if that's a little bit of Kvothe retelling the story years later, you know, where he's. Yeah. And that's what makes it interesting is you have this narrator who's recounting events that happened years earlier. Um, whereas when you're more immediately in the moment, like in a song of ice and fire or something, you might have language like the pit in my stomach was palpable or something like yeah. that. And instead it's like, I didn't have anything else yeah. to do. So I just walked yeah. around. Right. And you also, again, we've, you know, beaten it to death a little bit, but I'll continue to beat it to death because it's, I think it's an important part of, I think it's actually a really important part of what Pat's trying to do is, you know, that, that both is a, a totally unreliable narrator, uh, remembering things that happened, you know, quite a while ago now. Uh, and B, he flat out told us he's not necessarily telling the truth. He flat out told us, I'm going to tell the version of the story that I want to be the truth. Yeah, coming from I the want to be written down. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I doubt he's... We know he's prone to exaggerate. We know that already, right? And so I doubt he even considers... Well, because I had nothing to do and because I'm a badass, I wandered aimlessly through the university. There's no reason for him not to just kind of throw that out there and add to his legend, right? Right. I wasn't worried. I just wandered around. Yeah, it fits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It kind of fits. But we have to, we have to take, it's frustrating a little bit analyzing this book because it feels like you have to take every single thing with a grain of salt. There's Mm -hmm. no one there to check any of the things he's saying. To, to correct like, nah, dude that's not how it was we get it one time one time where bast is like i saw denna she wasn't that great <laughs> right and i think that happened already hopefully i didn't spoil it uh i don't think it's happened uh, <laughs> sorry for the spoiler it's not a huge spoiler right but no, like that it's, it's not but like that that <laughs> reminds us that like oh yeah we don't usually have anyone to to call him out and say that's not how it was right he can make up as much as he wants mm-hmm. right? and it's performative yes yeah uh you were gonna say something when i brought that up oh uh, just going back to the shirt thing like mm-hmm. like i know a shirt probably doesn't provide a ton of protection but yeah he's not it's something five days removed from Tarbine again. So it's, you know, the shirt is not worth risking for this. Mm-hmm. Right. Like he knows the value of a shirt. Right. He went, he went years wearing a burlap sack. Like he knows not to give up a shirt. For this. Yeah. The value of a talent in a later chapter. Yes. Oof. But, yes. Uh, we'll get to that later. But, yeah. Because um, how many shirts could you buy with a talent? You're right. It's a little inconsistent. <laughs> right. He, he's not weighing them all consistently right it's like oh the weight of getting the archives the weight of a shirt the weight of a talent he's not he's not doing the math very well this is another instance i love that you brought this up in that first chapter about how he's he's um adding to his legacy and and making these otherwise kind of no, somewhat normal experiences into legendary experiences He's adding to it without realizing he's doing it. You know, the taking the shirt off thing that just builds his legacy. He got up there and he didn't even have a shirt on and he didn't even have to have his hands tied to the bar he was holding on to. But to him, it was just like, I got two shirts. Can't ruin one of them. Yeah. But very logical everyone watching choice for him. It's like he got whipped. He didn't wear a shirt. It's adding to that, that legend. Without even knowing that he's doing it. And yet to him, these are, he, this isn't a legendary thing. And one thing he proactively very much did do to try to add to his legend, right, with the null root, right? Yeah. He says, I lied for a little bit of notoriety or whatever. Yeah. And so, you know, we'll, we get more about the null root in oh, your no, chapters here. But it. Yeah. It's different. But he, yeah, I mean, he's, he is very much trying to trying to have an effect here that people will ooh and awe over. He mm-hmm. knows what the Dalrut will do for him in this experience. And he's like, okay, this will help. This will, they'll see me, right? Yep. 
the you know the refusal to make a sound is his arrogance but also yeah again that's the i'm gonna make this a story for them you know like that is like that is very much on purpose the shirt isn't though so he stumbles mm-hmm. into some of it and some of it's proactive it's interesting yep. yeah we'll talk about that in the next chapter for sure yeah <laughs> will will is so uh He's he's so literal. There's that part at the very beginning on the bench, and I just wanted to bring it up, where uh, you know, like you said, he's come to be there for his friend, and uh, you know, I don't I don't know if Quoth really got that yet. That that's what he was really doing, because he asks him, "Are you doing anything?" Yes, Will. Are you doing anything? And Will says, "Sitting, breathing." <laughs> I love it so much. Those are the kinds of answers I give to my boys when they ask me questions. And they've adopted the, for themselves as well, like just very technical answers to the oh, questions. Just dry. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Mm, he is funny. And I love how Rothfuss throws in his little um, mistakes with the language uh-huh. every once in a while. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and, Me too. And he does it without a thought. They're, they're little key. I've got a few notes about things like that later too. They're just little things that Rothfuss does that humanize mm-hmm. all of these characters. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of authors, I feel like they don't, they don't bother to go to that level. Right. Sure. But yeah, yeah it really, it adds, it adds a lot of depth. We talk about that with George too, right. Where it's more with history and things like that, but they provide a, a richer world, right. <clears throat> this is a character thing, but it provides a richer world where, you know, yeah, there are different dialects and languages and this kid is, struggling through dealing yeah it's his second language it's a second language and he's dealing with it 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 just Mm -hmm. adds it just adds some richness to the story it really does and he does it so casually right yeah a lot of times an author might do that but they'll be very heavy-handed about it Mm -hmm. and rothfuss is very just casual just throwing it in and then his friends casually correct him you know and it just feels natural so Was, was was this the this was the chapter right where he's like it's an idiom and an idiom is he's like, I know what an idiom is. <laughs> Tell me what the idiom means. <laughs> yeah. And then he explains the idiom. He's like, that's another idiom. <laughs> <laughs> and then Quoth hits back with an yeah. idiom in his language. Just don't, to prove don't it. Don't put a fork in your eye over it. Uh, yep. yep. As, as someone who uses my second language very frequently, my second language being Portuguese, that all of that whole conversation rang very true with me. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, another thing Rothfuss do, does, I think I mentioned this already, is he takes jabs at things that he sees wrong, I think, in the real world. And mm. uh, we have a target here being the healthcare industry. Yeah, I have a similar note. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talking about, you know, the um, uh, the Medica, right? The basically the hospital at the yeah. university, right? Will fills both in on how that works. He says, you need not pay in advance. He says, they'll see anyone that, that comes in. They'll see help. them and yep. treat them and try to help them get better. Yep. And you don't have to pay for it up front, um, but you do have to pay later. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And if you can't, if you have no hard coin, you work until your debt is, and he has trouble with the word, and finally it's balanced. Yep, You yes. work until your debt is balanced with the Medica. If you leave without settling their debts, um, and you know, it's implied that they come after you pretty hard. <laughs> There's a sinister element to it. Right. 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 Yeah. And it's like, I see what you're doing there, Rothfuss. And I agree yeah. with you and well done. Well played yeah. buddy. Yeah. 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 He takes little shots like that. We've talked about it in previous episodes where he sees things that are kind of wrong in the world and he jabs at yes. him in his books. Yeah. He uses his books as a platform to kind of just take little shots. And I like that here. Yeah, I think we talked about that with uh, with the main religion uh, in one of the targeting mm-hmm. chapters a little bit. Yeah, we've talked about mm-hmm. it. Yeah, several several things. Um, yes, yeah, so status and social structure and things like that. Yeah, he's he's very good at that. Mm-hmm. I liked it here. Glad you found it too. I did. Uh, we already kind of talked about you know the fact that this is a place of learning. Whipping their students feels wrong. Um, mm-hmm. But again, I I wonder if it's born from, you know, the burning of Arcanists that are 
misusing sympathy, right? And so yeah. they have to, they feel like they've got Maybe. to run a very strict ship here. This is not just about education. We're giving you power here. And you have to you have to learn that there are consequences because if you don't learn consequences here, you go out in the world and they'll start burning us, right? If you do these bad things out there. Yeah. Not only will they burn you, they might burn the guy next to you. Right. Yeah. yeah. Good point. But, if, but it still feels wrong. I mean, it's like, okay, he, so he did this thing in class. His teacher got a little upset and embarrassed. We're going to whip him? Publicly? Like, okay, how about we make him work at the student union for the semester or something? Clean like, the bathrooms yeah. or something. <laughs> right. I don't like, know. Come on, man. But, <laughs> all right. Old boys yeah. club. Get in line. Get in line, kid. You don't do this to the masters. Speaking of boys club, let me ask you this, this burning question, Scad, that's very okay. important to the overall, you know, arc of the book. What's the difference between a sanctioned and an unsanctioned brothel? It's okay. mentioned in this chapter. I I imagine I, I have no idea. I'm talking <laughs> out of my ass, but I imagine. It has to do with, you know, like having a license for it versus like a union thing or like a, you know, that you have to adhere to certain standards if you're a sanctioned brothel, whereas if you're not, then you don't. Right. Maybe maybe benefits for being sanctioned or you can charge higher rates or, you know. Just an interesting thing in this little college town. You call it sanctioned and unsanctioned brothels. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it's code too. For like, well, these ones are for rich people and these ones are for students. Right. You know, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Again, maybe. a class, classist thing. Right? Big time classist thing. But again, I have no idea. I guess yeah. I very important to the story. Yes. Very, very important. important. Yeah. But again, it, it does go to the world building. It's like, oh, well, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. What, is, what is this world like that there are sanctioned and unsanctioned ones? You know? Yep. Okay, I think that's all I got. Bloodless. Bloodless. Do it. Uh, you know, the damage wasn't as bad as it could have been, according to Master Arwell. Two straight, shallow, and fairly clean cuts. They'll scar nicely. The ladies will like them. Uh, and still hopped up on the pain-numbing null root. Quoth even turns down local anesthetic to numb the pain as he's being stitched up. Um, this he did not tell the master. He didn't tell Master Arwile that he's turning down anesthetic because he's hopped up on some sort of natural numbing agent. But Arwile perceives it anyway and puts him to the question, why would he drug himself to numb the pain but still choose to remove the shield, thin as it may be, of his shirt? Be honest, he warns, or he'll send Quoth away right then. So Quoth is honest. He reveals the truth about his poverty and that he only owns two shirts. And as for the drugs, well, he knew he had a target on his back due to his age and accelerated acceptance in the Arcanum, not to mention what he'd just done to him. And he didn't want to appear weak to anyone watching him in the crowd, least of all Master Hem. The best way to stay safe, he says he's learned, is to make your enemies think that you can't be hurt. That's why he did it. Arwell accepts this, and the sewing up is performed by one of his Raylar, pretty girl by the name of Mola. She proves adept, adept at the task and even shows interest in both Quoth's courage and also his fair skin before Arwell, his fair skin. Did I say her fair skin? His fair skin before Arwile dismisses her. Alone again with Quoth, Arwile asks if he would like to study under him at the Medica, to which Quoth replies enthusiastically in the affirmative. So Arwile invites him to come back in four days. I will have you here, he says. That ends our our chapter. You got any scars, man? I do. Yeah? You like them or do you not like them? I like them a lot. Yeah. Scars are cool to have. No big ones. None like stretching <clears throat> across my back. But... Yeah, I mean, those are the ones you really don't want, probably. Right. Yeah. Besides like stretch marks, you know. <laughs> Kidding. Yes. Kidding. What about you? Do you have big scars anywhere? Do you have any cool ones? No, no. I have 
you probably can't see them on the camera, but oh, oh, I can see it bit. right under your thumb there. Yeah, yeah. that's mm -hmm. I can um, see it. that kind of runs up through here too. Oh, I yeah. can't see it going up there. Oh, I kind of can. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's not a it's not a super sexy story. I was I don't know 12, 13 playing roller roller hockey. Oh, nice. Fell, and the other kid's skate just like went over me Ugh. and just kind of cut it open and. Yeah, there was like a rock lodged in the big one. And, nice. Yeah, I I like them fine. They're not, you know, they're not uh, they're not really cool stars, I guess. But I like them fine. Yeah, I wouldn't you think of myself as a scars are cool guy necessarily, but uh, yeah, I like them fine. Yeah, yeah. What do you got? Is this a? Are we doing a chasing Amy here? We can if you want. Like comparing scars. I got a great one under my chin. A lot of people have scars here, right? You fall when you're a kid and mm -hmm. I got a, one kind of across there. Yeah. That's from a uh, hockey puck. Um, I learned things that I, I'm a little bit like both and that I can be a slow learner uh -huh. when I, you know, as soon as I finished playing hockey in high school in which you have to wear full face protection in high yeah. school, yeah. Um, as soon as that was done, you know, <laughs> stupid idiot, Matt, wanted to be cool. And so when he started playing just recreational hockey after high school, I took my face protection off and just had an open mask. Uh -huh. And I played like that for a few years. Yeah. Uh, I got hit in the nose by a puck, uh -huh. broke it. So I put on a half shield over uh -huh. my face, just covering my eyes and my nose. Yeah. Played with that for a few years. And then a few years back, I got hit in the puck in or hit with the puck in my chin burst open my chin had to get yeah. any stitches and everything so now i wear full face protection uh -huh. but yeah uh -huh. i have to learn the hard way every it's time like those I'm, i know they're all retired now but there was a time where they introduced helmets into the nhl but if you were yeah if you started playing by a certain time you were grandfathered and you didn't have to wear uh -huh. one. and still it's like still maybe just wear one just, like, just put it on just like, put it on anyway maybe <laughs> like congratulations actually... we can see you're old They've actually on. now done that with uh, half shields in hockey. They've grandfathered those in too. Oh, really? And there's only, I think, maybe less than 10 players that don't have a half yeah. shield now that play just with their faces yeah. unmasked, unprotected. So, yeah. <clears throat> huh. Anyways. Anyways. I like um, Arwill. I like him too. Yeah. He's, what do you uh, like about him? Well, he, he, it, I mean, he... Picks out pretty quickly. He he is hard on himself for not picking it out quicker, but he picks out pretty quickly. That there's something different about both that he's acting weird, that there's something going on, you know, and diagnoses it pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, he's skeptical. I like people that are skeptical and want to like see evidence and proof and things like that. Um, I don't know. I I feel like his motivations seem good. You know, right. he's not out to to get both, but he wants to know really what's going on. You know. And uh, and then when, you know, when he's presented with the evidence rather than dismissing it, like like a member of the old boys club might, he's like, OK, that makes sense. Yeah, you you are in a I position. Yeah. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. in a position that I'm not in that I can understand the way you tell it that you've got enemies here that are everybody's looking to get a piece of you. Right? Yeah. yeah. So you're you're trying to protect that. So, yeah, I like him. He seems like a reasonable person, which, you know. It's that he's a doctor, I guess. Like that's what I was just about to say. You explaining it that way made me go, Oh, brilliant, Rothfuss. That's what you'd expect from a doctor, especially right. a really good doctor, is yeah. they're gonna chase their way to a diagnosis, try to get right to it. And he yeah. does that. Tell me what's going on, or I'm kicking yeah. you out. You know, yeah. he's gonna get right to the bottom of a diagnosis and then accept, it. okay, that's what it is, because that's what I see, right? Yeah. And that's what a doctor does. And yeah. And I think you, you can tell that he likes Mola and she seems similar. Mm -hmm. She's kind of forceful about it. You know, she's like, well, you know, this is how it is. And you can refuse the anesthetic, but you're an idiot. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Just like telling <laughs> how it is. Right. And, and she seems capable and knowledgeable and knows all of her stuff immediately. But like, I did have a little bit of a problem with the method at which they choose who does what work. They go fetch the next railer on the list. Just uh, bring them in. Yeah. Like they don't rate them and be like, well, this one knows how to do this. So that would be good for them to do it. I have developers. 
that have no idea how to do UI work. I don't give the UI work to those developers, right? <laughs> like we train them up sometimes so they get the experience, right? But like, what if I walked in with cancer? Did they just bring in, you know, random guy? The that, guy that pulled a C minus in right. neuropathy yeah. last year, semester yeah. or something. <laughs> like C's get degrees. It feels, uh, I don't, I don't love the method of how they choose. who Yeah. Work. yeah. But, other than, but I think, I, is you know, that if, real? Is that how it is for us too? Maybe it is a little. I don't know. Like, It'd be interesting to ask like our friend, Dr. Lindsay Dr. about Lindsay. what, you know, things like residency or like your internship yeah. as you're going through medical school and how that is. I, yeah. I think that when you're a RALAR, you're just expected, you have a higher expectation placed upon you that. Yeah. You're, you're going to be called stuff. upon to do something and you need to know what it is and you're not going to be prepared for it. All I'm just going to call you in, you know, yeah, if right. you're, if you're up next, you just have to do it. And That's fair. It's kind yeah. of his way of seeing how prepared someone really is. Notice he's right there. So if he noticed something's wrong, he can yeah. hopefully step in before they do too much damage. And that kind of makes sense too, from what we hear in a later chapter where they're talking about itching your wagon to one of these guys. Mm-hmm. And he says, our will's very specific. X number of terms for this, then this. X number of terms for that, then this. And it's very methodical right. and planned. And mm-hmm. he knows if you don't have the experience and the time to familiarize yourself with these concepts, he can't call on you for just anything. Right. Maybe, yeah. Maybe that all adds up. Like maybe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, from all the TV shows that I watch that I'm sure are extremely accurate. ER. Yeah, you have those, yes. You have those little house. I'm sure it was the most accurate. <laughs> you have like, you know, these little traveling pods of doctors and they're, Kind of all working together to, you know, well, what would you do in this case? And they're kind of all giving their opinions and stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that's how it is, right, Lindsay? Always. Yeah. Yeah. At the same time, uh, Arwile is a professor at a university. Um, and so I love how the last sentence in the chapter says his eyes twinkled as he considers the prospect of... Uh, both studying under him, the mm-hmm. Medica. And that goes back to that pride thing. Yeah. You know, you see it in all levels. I'm of, gonna get him. You want to be the guy behind the next big guy. Mm-hmm. What is it in Hercules, uh, the Disney version? What's the little guy's name? Bill. Oh. Bill, his trainer, yeah. and how yeah. he's so excited to have finally trained someone that the came up it. and became a star. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I know that. Yeah. It, it makes sense. So and even if someone how... as methodical as our while wants to be the guy behind yes. the legend, you yes. know? Yeah. And yeah. Hitch, hitch their name to him as much as they're hitching. He's good point. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. I like that. You wonder how much they kind of fight for the different students. Uh-huh. Did he have to fight for Molo? Was Molo like big in the fishery too? And <laughs> you know, you wonder big in the fishery. <laughs> I don't fit in here, sir. You covered it in your summary. This is just kind of his mindset since arriving, right? And really, I think it kind of feels like it's his mindset since losing his family. He just Mm -hmm. doesn't feel like he fits anywhere. Right. Right. His moments where he fits. He was on that stage and giving a lecture and it felt like he, you know, things snapped in and maybe things fit. And that makes sense. Yeah. He spent his whole life performing. So that feels like home. Yeah. A stage feels like home. Sure. And he he thinks they can tell that he can't fit, right? Like all the students, which is weird because I would think he would feel like he can fake that. Yeah. But maybe that's just something he's telling our while. Right. But yeah. Uh, you, you wonder like, we'll talk about it more too in, in Day After Dark, but like, where does he fit? We've heard from Abanthi that he could probably do anything. But like, what is his fit, right? Like, what? Where would he really actually be content and best? Mm-hmm. You know, he's gonna. I, I feel like he's gonna be saying, "I don't fit," his whole life. Right. And I wonder if that's a sign of greatness when you don't fit. You yeah. don't fit into a box. Yeah. Because you are that point oh one percent of greatness that creates a new box you know yeah either that or it's just ego (laughs) 
it probably, probably takes a healthy yeah. dose of ego to stay in that 0.01%, yeah. right? But, yeah. Yeah, just those transcendent individuals, you know? Yes. The Elon Interesting. Musks of the world. <laughs> Let's go with someone a little less harmless uh, or more harmless. Taylor Swift. My my daughter just went to uh, your, your girl back there behind you. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, Brittany. It's Brittany Biatch. My daughter just went to Taylor Swift in Denver and okay. just hearing her describe what that experience was like in uh-huh. 75,000 people yeah. and watching the videos that Leia had taken from her phone, you know, Taylor Swift, like her music or not, yeah. is transcending every yeah. other artist that even comes close to her in this genre. I mean, mm-hmm. this will rankle some of our listeners. She's approaching like Beatles status. Really? Of just her ability to churn out hits yeah. and just consistently since she was 14 years old, yeah. just churn out hit song after hit song after hit song that are just like staying with people and that people just identify with. And it's, it's pretty amazing what she's becoming and maybe what she's already become, you know, and she's what, is she barely in her thirties? Yeah. She's 31 or something. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a huge fan. I, I don't think I've probably said that before, but I find some of her stuff catchy, right? She's 33. And then she, and she writes her stuff too, right? So, um, you know that that's always a plus for me. The pop stars that are just getting stuff handed to them is less impressive to me than when they're, of course, when they're writing it themselves and everything. I gotta say, I don't love this anti-hero song. It's <laughs> all the rage these days. I don't like it at all. But but I, you know, some of her stuff is really toe tappy. You know, good stuff. So and I, people I really, seem I really to identify the, it with it. The Romeo they... and Juliet song. I really they seem to just, it strikes a chord, you know, yeah. it's, yeah. it's becoming like, like Billy Joel for my family is a four generation thing. You know, yeah. my kids love Billy Joel. I grew up on Billy Joel. My parents love Billy Joel, their parents. Well, my dad's parents like Billy Joel, mm-hmm. you know, Taylor Swift is becoming that man. But anyways, this isn't a Taylor Swift podcast. Uh, Not yet. She hasn't taken over this corner of the world. <laughs> Not yet. And I, I'm like you, I don't listen to a ton of her music, but I'm starting to see that greatness that she seems to possess. And it's pretty remarkable. Mm-hmm. Um, Transcendent while, is a word I don't use much. Mm-hmm, probably shouldn't. Shouldn't be overused. Yeah. Arwell, Should be reserved. Yeah. yeah. Our while is pretty great. <laughs> there we go. Our while is <laughs> transcendent. <laughs> Apparently. Uh, I was trying to think if I had anything else. Um, oh, just back to your point about, you know, quoth consciously doing things to build himself up, um, publicly. Uh, we see that that's, that's among other things, a protection mechanism for him, right? As he learned on the street, the best way to stay safe, he says, is to make your enemies think you can't be hurt. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, he's going to go uh, with this null route, null route. He's going to make sure he doesn't bleed. People are like, I can't even make the kid bleed if I get in a fight with him. Mm-hmm. He's going to go get stitched up in the Medica. Uh, maybe the tale of the fact that he didn't take any any anesthetic for it will also escape. And people will be like, he doesn't feel pain. <laughs> you know, like he didn't say anything when he was whipped either, like scream out. Right, yeah. I'm not going to mess with this guy. Right. Or I'm going to think twice before I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't work for the guy in our next chapter. Who? Are you ready to move on? Want to go there? I'm I'm ready to go there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh. (sighs) This chapter. Yes. Still under the numbing effects of the Nile root, maybe. But Kvothe has waited a long time to be able to explore the stacks. And with his recent admission to the Arcanum, he can now research whatever he wants himself without anyone seeing his requests and judging them as quote-unquote childish, like Lauren warned him. Well, he could, that is, if Ambrose would let him in. The wealthy noble is too busy forcefully flirting with Fella, literally holding her there while he tried to win her over. Fella, for her part, was clearly uncomfortable and tense. 
Ambrose insists that Quoth isn't in the book yet, so we can't let him in. Tells him to get lost. Instead, Quoth interferes more, insulting Ambrose's poetry right in front of Fella, doing all he can to cock block Ambrose, as if Ambrose isn't doing that to himself already. He distracts Ambrose enough that he can get Fella out of there to search for a book for him. Since Ambrose won't let him into stacks on his own, she'll go look for on his behalf. Grave will be free, she rushes off to help. But that does leave he and Ambrose alone. And worse, it seems to coincide with the null root starting to wear off. The side effects of null root are mental and physical exhaustion. It takes such an extreme toll on Quoth that he doesn't notice when Ambrose starts being overly conciliatory. Ambrose agrees to let him into the stacks if Quoth promises to forget all the fumbling with Fella that he just saw. But also, of course, Quoth would need to pay a stacks fee, one talent. Oh, and he'd need a hand lamp, but you can buy them here, one and a half talents. Oh, oh no, no more money? Oh, here, just take this candle. I'll even give it to you. And he doesn't even make Quoth sign in to get in. All very generous from Ambrose, and Quoth starts to think maybe he's misjudged this chap. Ambrose hurries him into the stacks and shuts the door behind him. Quoth uses a little sympathy to get his candle going and is in heaven. Tens of thousands of books at his disposal. It's like Bell at the Beast Library, right? <laughs> if only he could focus. The Nauru completely worn off. His thoughts were leaden, and he, was, he wasn't going to be, be in for much reading today. Still, he couldn't help but wander and wander and wander in the books until he came upon a stone door. And it's important enough, I think, that I'm going to read you a little bit about that stone door. It was quite by accident that I found the four-plate door. It was made of a solid piece of gray stone, the same color as the surrounding walls. Its frame was eight inches wide, also gray, and also one single seamless piece of stone. The door and frame fit together so tightly that a pin couldn't slide into the crack. It had no hinges, no handle, no window or sliding panel. Its only features were four hard copper plates. They were set flush with the face of the door, which was flush with the front of the frame, which was flush with the wall surrounding it. You could run your hand from one side of the door to the next and hardly feel the lines of it at all. An interesting door mm. for sure. Each plate had a keyhole in it, but both got the distinct impression that this door was not for opening. This was a door for staying closed. Of note is one word carved in the center, Valeritas. He wanted to get in so bad he could taste it, looking through the keyholes, pushing on the door. Nothing helped. Just then, two sympathy lamps approached. Slowly at first, before one of the scribes runs at Quoth, takes his candle and douses it immediately. What are you doing with an open flame in here? Of course, effing Ambrose. He plays the part well enough when challenged, and there's no evidence that Ambrose signed him in. So Quoth is left to rage, to the rage of the normally quiet Lauren. Rage Lauren does, banishing Quoth after quickly gauging the situation from the accounts given. Your hand held the fire. Yours is the blame. That is the lesson all adults must learn. Both makes his way to the mess for some food, regretting the null route. Yes, the null route had gained him notoriety, but he could hear the student as he could hear the students whisper, whispering about how he hadn't even bled. But the cost of that notoriety was his dull mind that couldn't suss out Ambrose's tricks nor defend himself against Lauren's judgments. He tries to find solace in his friends, confessing to Manet and Simmons that he, Simmons that he was banned, not suspended, banned with no time limit. Also, the scrib had charged him a stack fee and given him the candle, even though hand lamps were supposed to be free. Free. Simon and Manet do their best to warn Quoth about Ambrose. He isn't the kind of guy you want a rivalry with, much less actual trouble. He's very wealthy and will stop at nothing to punish those that wrong him. One time, buying up the debt of a rival and had him clamped in irons. He has money and he knows how to use it, and the temperament not to hold back when doing so. Both getting the point, raises his voice to make clear that he is not threatening anyone, but then recites five lines from a play. <laughs> Upon him I will visit famine and find a fire, till all around him desolation rings, and all the demons in the outer dark look on amazed and recognize that vengeance is the business of a man. So Quoth is not backing down. And that is the end of that chapter. He does Sorry. not back down, Skad, does he? Sorry for the lengthy summary. Uh, mm -hmm. No, no, he doesn't. Uh, I, it's just not in him. I, 
again, I mean, kind of back to what he said, Darwell, right? Like, if he backs down, then it, it shows weakness, right? But there's maybe that line, like you were saying earlier, about, well, maybe you don't have to destroy the guy. Maybe, like, stand up to him and hold back a little bit. You know? Right. Yeah. Don't show weakness, but you don't got to crush the guy. <laughs> and, you know, inflict famine and, pl- what was it? Famine and fire? Yeah, it was like biblical the way Desolation he rings. <laughs> yeah, it felt like. Vengeance is the business of a man. Remember Dogs people? and cats living together. Mass hysteria. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's a troubling thing. Maybe we'll come back to it later on. But uh, what I'm seeing in Quoth, you know, talking about the common thing is getting vengeance on the Chandra and, you know, learning everything about them to, you know, for this major, you know, count of Monte Cristo revenge moment in defeating them. Um, what, what this reader is seeing is bits of vengeance incorporated into his everyday life. Like mm. he, All things. he is, fixated on the topic of vengeance a lot of what he does is motivated by getting back at somebody yeah that's not the Um, jedi way for sure it's really not and you see it throughout these these chapters is this guy he he wants to hit back and it drives him and maybe it adds to his greatness that he's so driven but one of those drivers among other things, I'm not saying it's his sole motivator, but it's one of them. Yeah, it's one of sure what is. drives him is is vengeance, and not just against the Chandrian, not just against the Chandrian. In fact, Chandrian is mentioned very little in this block of chapters. Yeah, no, that's true. He talks um, about why in his interlude, right? Yes. Um, so we won't talk about that too much right now, but uh, but uh, no, I think you're right. Um, vengeance is a part of his it's a part of his everyday life. And I, I don't know whether, you know, like, like you just said, Darwell, that's a kind of a part of, of showing that you shouldn't be attacked, right. Is going out and showing it. Maybe he thinks, yeah. maybe he thinks he needs to do this a few times and then people will just back off. Mm-hmm. But, but again, when you overdo it the way he does it, you're just going to, you're just going to perpetuate the cycle. Right. Yeah. And it does seem to be a very fast transition for him. I was wrong. Vengeance. Vengeance! Like, immediate. Like, it's all he considers a lot of options. Right? right. Like, yep. of course, vengeance is, that's the that's the only hammer tool I have. I'll hit it, I'll hit it with the hammer. Vengeance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not good. I mean, you could, you could give him, not a pass, but you could explain it by saying, you know, like, look, Tarbine taught him that this is the yeah. way you have to be. Maybe. You gotta, you know, pick the pick the biggest bully in the schoolyard and fight them on your first day at school, right. To establish yourself. We also need to remember that, like, I I think he was taught a lot of compassion growing up with his parents. And he remembers a lot of things that he was taught as a kid with them. Mm-hmm. So it's weird to say he wouldn't remember, but he hasn't been shown a lot of, a lot of compassion over the last, you know, three years. Mm-hmm. And so he doesn't, I don't, I don't think, you know, empathy is he doesn't know it right yeah it's difficult for him and and he was in a place you know certainly the people that they went around with their troop and visited they weren't always kind to the rue but he also i feel like he was in such a controlled environment everyone was good to each other in his environment so he probably didn't have a lot of excuse for needing vengeance he loses them has no circle to bounce his emotions off of and has anger in him already about what happened. So vengeance is a pretty easy place to land. Right. But you're, but, it, but you're right. It's not good. <laughs> it's not it's great. Not, no, it's, you know, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. doesn't speak well of him. And when he does have compassion shown towards him, he often has trouble recognizing it or, really internalizing it and appreciating it, which I get. I know I sometimes am in that way, you know, getting the shoes from the cobbler a few chapters yeah. ago. Um, he recognized it for sure, but he didn't know how to, right? Like he didn't know how to like 
uh, deal with the kindness. Right. Or yeah, really internalize it. Or the father and son, when he was came into Tarbine the first time that offered him mm -hmm. basically come live with us. Yeah. And he turned him down. Didn't realize it till it was too late what he was missing out on. Like um, say, say yes to the kindnesses is what you're saying. Something okay. like that. It, it's, you know, you mentioned he hasn't had a lot of compassion shown towards him. Mm -hmm. And I agree. And we're only getting you know, we get, we get them thrown at us. You know, there was that two episodes ago, I think it was, it was almost like every chapter we had picked out a hero in that chapter mm -hmm. of someone yep. who'd done nice things for Quoth, right? And yep. it's like chapter after chapter, after chapter. Um, but, you know, we're reading these by chapters where months pass between sure. and we forget the, you know, 365 days that he went without receiving compassion probably yeah. in any way, shape or form. So, but the fact that he's, because again, we got to remember he's telling this story, so he remembers those moments of compassion. They stuck they with stuck him. with him, mm -hmm. right? They were important enough for him to remember. It's not like he, you know, they blew past him or anything, right? It's interesting. So it's yeah. telling that he chooses that his mind remembers those things and he chooses to tell them. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And still, though, vengeance is the quick solution most of the time. Quick solution. Yeah, you know? that's what he naturally goes to. He's also very kind, though, you know? Yeah. yeah. He didn't have to do those things for Fela. No, he's, you know? well, he's very much about protecting people that can't protect themselves, for sure. Sure, and that's Probably that shows. In... Stems from, you know, having his whole family murdered. And they can't protect themselves. Right. Might and you wonder, that. you know, there's that heartbreaking instance a few chapters yes. back where he doesn't protect somebody mm -hmm. who needed protection. Yeah. And you have to wonder if those feelings of guilt motivate the protection now. Yeah. I mean, he says that in one of the interludes, he says, that's as good a place as any to say that that's, that's why I became who I was mm -hmm. that moment. That's right. He does that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> this is more like someone falling down a set of stairs, uneven stairs <laughs> oh, with a mid savage, just savage. <laughs> a limp at least has rhythm. This he is just more like keeps someone going. falling down a set of stairs. Yep. It's like he's already down. He's down, man. Ambrose yeah. is on the ground. He's bleeding. The day I ask you for help with poetry is the day you have two hours, two hard hours to give. <laughs> Savage. Oh. Dude. It's interesting because, uh, you know, the null route we're about to hear is about to wear off, but he is, he's right on it with the poetry insults. Like oh, he's going. He's going. Yeah, it didn't seem to affect his wit then. Lightning quick, those comebacks. But you know what? I kind of love that the bully Ambrose is into poetry. <laughs> you know, just like humanizing characters and everything, like yeah. you mentioned with Will and Sim. I kind of love that this big bully Ambrose sits and tries to write poetry. <laughs> That's a generous read. I, I felt like he's tried with Fela so many things so he's doing it so too. he's finally trying poetry because it's like nothing is <laughs> yeah i am being generous in my mind i've got this guy who has this hard exterior oh, but then yeah. when he's alone at night he's sitting at his desk just like <laughs> plugging away trying to write this poetry my and when... book of poems <laughs> <laughs> when this kid comes in and just starts bashing it yeah. He's just toppling his whole, you know, whole house world. of cards that he'd gotten so high. <laughs> Both just comes in and just destroys it. it. <laughs> yeah. And just shatters him. But that's uh, my generous read of Ambrose. <clears throat> you know that uh, there's like that meme of the guy sitting in, I think they're at a baseball game. And he's like got his hand on the woman the, there's like a blonde woman oh yeah and he's like leaning he's just, in and talking like leaning in and like talking to her he doesn't look i just gave her like a malicious face he doesn't look mean necessarily but just like the hand is like gripping her and like controlling her like almost keeping her there and That's her face very was. much says i don't want to be hearing what yes, you have to say yeah she doesn't look terrified like fela seems very uncomfortable the woman sure. in the meme doesn't look that bad but bored for sure <laughs> like i don't want to be here yeah <laughs> That's that's what made me. That's what this this little section made me think of. Is that I one. like it. Yep, absolutely. It's called uh, it's called bro explaining. <clears throat> is what that thing's called. Bro explaining. Yeah, bro yeah. explaining. Ugh. 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, the null wrote uh, really. <laughs> It really screws them. I mean, the, the signs are all there, right? I mean, I kind of went through them pretty heavy handed in the summary, but you'd like to think that if his mind weren't dulled, yeah, he would have, you know, immediately he gets offered a deal for very little cost. Forget what you saw. That's all that's all he asks. Like, just forget what you saw with Vela. I don't fine, I'll let you in. And then he, you know, you, well, you do have to, of course, pay his fee. I'm really sorry about that. Like he should have known, right? this doesn't seem right why would i pay a fee to be at the university already i don't why would there be a fee you know like no signing the book should have should be a red flag everything is about the book right here's a candle yeah. while looking at like he's ambrose is looking around and he says just take the candle like he should have seen that like it both has really good instincts about this kind of stuff and yeah i, I feel like yeah i know really really did a number on him Really did a number, but this comes back to the uh, unreliable narrator point that you brought up and how we have to almost mm. question everything yeah. because a part of me thought is quote later quote blaming Making it on excuses. the null root. Yeah. yeah. He really just got yeah. swindled. When... Yeah. I have a similar thing. I, I have uh, <laughs> the only way in quote's mind that he could have been bested by Jackus. Was if he was under the influence of you know some sort of medication, right? Yeah, that's the only he way this guy ever got the best of me. Uh -huh. Listen, it happened once that he got the better of me, and there were all these things happening. Yep, it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> nice. On solo, look at us go. Yeah. <sighs> um. So he gets into the stacks. Why? They're why would there be candles, man? Why would there even be candles in this place? Good question. Bad idea. Mm -hmm. And and we're told, I can't remember if it's now or later, that they keep it dark in order to protect the books, right? Yes. Some of them are uh, so yeah. old that. Yes, I think Fella says it maybe. So they walk around in pitch dark. Well, there with are sympathy, sympathy lamps. lamps. Yeah, but yeah. And I don't, I, well, we get it later. And I, I, fin I finally finished reading uh, The Name of the Wind. I got through it a couple weeks ago. I started nice. on a wise man's fear here in a minute. But uh, we, we get some information later about the cataloging of the books in the library, mm. in the archives mm -hmm. later. And it's just fascinating. Like, yes, tens of thousands of books. How is he going to find what he wants among them? Right. Like he talks about, he's just wandering around in this candle, like just looking, like just, I don't know, reading titles. Like what, what is he, you know, what is he looking oh, for? Man. What, what can you ocean, possibly dude. find? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a mess. Yeah. Yeah. Can't wait to talk about that chapter. Welcome to your dream, buddy. Yes. Your dream. I mean, I guess mm -hmm. when you've been, uh, when you've been parched, like, any book will do maybe but like for his specific research that he's interested in good luck good luck yeah yeah Buckle but he, up, he's an optimist the answers to all my questions were here somewhere waiting is what he says and that's a lovely sentiment it really is just got to stick with it yep and then he blows it <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he should. He What's should Lauren's there. deal, man? Loves books. He's got a sacred charge to to protect them, right? I feel like it's, you know, I mean, it's a more extreme version of somebody's butterfly collection or stamp collection or something like those yeah. things go up in flames and they freak out. This is, you know, it, I think it's more serious than that. I think he actually has, well. Debbie after dark stuff, but I actually think he has, you know, maybe some charge, you know, to, to like protect this information, right? Right. And um I don't I, I don't blame him at all really for this. I, I suppose I don't either with you explaining that. It's just with the whole bringing up the reckless use of sympathy charge a couple yes. chapters ago. Yeah. And then this now, 
It's like, what's your deal? What do you got against this kid? You went out of your way to help him a couple, yep. a few chapters before that, and kind and, of explained to him the you know the way things work around here. And we remember that he is the one that asked about Arlid and the Bard. Mm-hmm. So maybe he does have something against him. But yep. we don't, right? We don't know. But maybe I mean he it's showed some familiarity, right? Yeah, maybe maybe he's only maybe he's only you know, a, a master at the university because Arlid and k- kicked him out of the room because he was <laughs> couldn't hold in a stage fart or something, you know, like but like, who knows? That's we, gotta be it. That's gotta be it. We don't know. <laughs> Send that to Rothfuss. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like he might actually have an axe to grind with Quoth or mm-hmm. or not close specifically, but maybe what Quoth might represent, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, but um, or not, or maybe he brought up the reckless use of sympathy, and he would have done it with anybody because he's just so by the book. That he's yeah, he's just he just did. Yeah, and 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 he loves his books, like you said, and anyone who would have been caught with a candle, that's instant banishment. Just no questions asked. I mean, the reaction we get from Mene and Simon implies. The like, oh, he, oh, yeah, like he would have must have lo- blown a gasket, <laughs> you know, like, of course, you're a band, mm-hmm. you know, like, yeah, three things all wise men fear the sea and storm, a night with no moon, and the anger of a gentle man. I love that, yeah, the anger of a gentle man being, being Lord in this case, yeah, that's that's me. My kids have told me. Oh yeah. When dad gets angry, we know it's serious. Yeah. Because dad ought, doesn't often get angry. So. Yeah. What is it? Uh, my trick is I'm always angry. <laughs> hey, Doctor Banner. Yeah. Uh, but but I get what you mean. My kids, my anger feels like it barely even raises raises a red flag with them. They're like, oh, dad's angry again. <laughs> that's screaming about something yeah. uh, uh, you want to keep moving uh, I just have one one more thing I'll accept um, it the uh, there's something I like to call in my life my day is too full right like if if it's just too full like I don't want to do more if I've done enough. And there, I understand that's a very vague way of putting it. And it really is vague. It depends on the day and, you know, what I can handle. Right. But mm-hmm. both was just whipped. He was just repaired from being whipped. He's dealing with a drug coursing through his system. That's enough, man. Just go home. Just go home and sleep. When you try to do too much in a day, your day's already full, man. Like you don't need to do more. Go home. And it's really hard, I think, for impatient people. But and I'm, you know, I'm very impatient. But like, this all goes away if he just goes home. Sleep. Go off. home. Sleep with your new stitches. Figure out, you know, how to sleep on your side or whatever. Mm-hmm. And just call it a day. You don't need to be out there doing more stuff. Just call it a day, man. You've had enough. Your day was full. You're done. You don't have to do more. Put it down. Put the day down. That's all. Yep. Maybe that's what he's going to do. He's going to go to the archives, grab a book, <laughs> just have something to read, and then go back up to his bed and do exactly what you said. Maybe. No, that's not what he was going to do. No. That's absolutely not what he was going to no. do. I mean, especially when he found the door. Yep. That could have probably distracted. If, if the scripts hadn't come by, that probably would have, the door would have distracted him for more hours, like hours. Anyway, that's uh, all. And we have conveniently, you've noticed, listeners, not talked about the door at all yet, besides Scad's summary. Yeah, should we? Do you nope. have anything about I, the door? I mean, the door. Conspicuous in the sense that every bit of wall space that he's seen so far is covered in books, books. except for this. Yeah. 
So it will I it'll probably be the main topic of Demi After Dark. I've got some other notes in there, but they're not really important. Right. I mean, I know you put a couple things in too. Um anyway, yeah, we'll we'll talk about that in Demi After Dark. Anyway. Okay. I will say, uh, you know, I don't think this is really a spoiler. The third book is supposed to be called The Doors of Stone. Correct. Might be referring to the doors. The or, mm. uh, or or yeah, amongst other doors, perhaps. Mm-hmm. But uh yeah, okay. The burning glass, Matt. The burning glass, which is chapter farty far. Farty far. The fishery has nothing nothing to do with fish, believe it or not. It's just a clever name for the artificery artificery or where the likes of glass blower, glass blowers joiners potters glaziers and metallurgists hone their craft at the center of it all was master kilvin's workshop where quoth finds himself as agreed the day after his whipping <clears throat> it's not long before quoth notices what master kilvin calls his lovelies 50-ish glass spheres suspended from the high ceiling They were lamps, and all of them were burning in their own unique way. They were all of them experiments, all filled with different concoctions and substances in Kilvin's quest to craft an ever-burning lamp. He's got one that's gone for 70 days, and if it makes it six more, that'll be a new record for the 10 years he's been at this little quest. After examining Quoth's hands and deeming them to be Keldar hands, good for artificing one would infer kilvin states that if his head is as clever as his hands look he should join him in the fishery later at the bar quoth's friends fill him in on how things work around these parts a master has to sponsor a student to relar so find one and just one to focus on and suck up to him and his buddy brandure are out as is lauren after the whole stacks debacle Man drag over in chemistry is full of new Elyr, and Arwile sticks to a rigorous curriculum that can take up to, by this reader's count, 24 terms. It is medical school after all. Kilvin, the master Bodies artificer. Are more complicated. They're... Bodies are more complicated in this world. I'm sure. <laughs> Kilvin, who's the master artificer, and Exa, Elksa Dahl, the master sympathist, seem to be the obvious choices. What about Elodin? Quoth asks. In all his interactions with him, the master namer had seemed nice enough and even supportive of Quoth at times. Why not study under him? Well, there's just one problem, his friends reveal. Elodin doesn't really teach. He's cracked, they call it. He's gone crazy. Turns out he was chancellor of the whole school until about five years ago. He's a bit of a prodigy. Not unlike Quoth himself, he was admitted to the university at 14 years old and was a full arcanist by age 18. His career seemed bright until something happened, and Elodin spent some time in the crockery until he recovered. Some say that he was never actually officially released from the crockery and that he escaped, even though the crockery is supposed to be built to prevent uh, arcanists escaping. In any case, though, you know, all this aside, uh, his friends point out that Kilvin already likes him. He's already invited him to study at the fishery. He's the obvious choice. Everyone agrees. You're going to go with him. But Quoth's thoughts were on Elodin and how he might approach the master namer. End of chapter. I didn't think about it until I heard the way you summarized this chapter. I love that, like, just because it's going to take a while. Will and Simon are like, oh, well, no, you can't do our while. It takes, yeah, you you, I know that. they know him already. They're like, you're too impatient. You'll never, you'll never make it. They're <laughs> like, he's out. He's out. Not because it's a bad fit, just because it'll take too long and you will not be satisfied with how fast it goes. Right. Yeah. Like, that's it. That's the only reason. You got kicked out. You got banished from the stacks after two days, buddy. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Couldn't wait. <laughs> Your day was full. You wouldn't go home. Uh, yeah, an interesting little chapter, uh, kind of talking about the path and giving sponsorships and 
And of course, we get to meet meet Kilburn a little bit better. Mm-hmm. He's uh, he's one of my favorite. He's definitely my favorite master. I just totally cool. Yeah, I picture this just big bear of a man with like big meat hooks for hands. Mm-hmm. And it made me it made me wonder about the hands comment because um, Lori. Oh no, I've forgotten his mother's name. That's bad. Uh, close mother comments on his hands, right, and how delicate and, and good they are. This guy is here. We think like this big bear of a man with big, strong digits and thick hands for artificing. He's complimenting his hands and saying he's got good hands for artificing. I think of Quoth having like delicate guitarist hands. Yeah, right, like dainty, very long right, fingered, long fingered, very precise and maneuverable not like big strong hands Mm -hmm. so i i guess i just wanted to hear like i don't genetics says they can't be both (laughs) so like i wonder what what uh (laughs) at the at at the tavern as he's telling the story did he put his hands behind his back and just pretends that he's got both like i'm perfect i have hands that are good for both things i guess he does man and interesting, though, that Kilvin says it took me years or whatever mm-hmm. to develop Kildish hands, mm-hmm. right? Meaning that it's something that you can attain. It's not just something you yeah. have or you don't have. Okay. So, so he sees the potential. Right. To Perhaps. Turn them into builder's hands. Right. Yeah. Maybe. And maybe it's beyond just the look of them. You okay. Know? Whether they're long fingered or big, meaty, stubby with dirt under the fingernails, I can't imagine Kilvin's being. Yes. Okay, you got you got me. I'll I'll buy it. Maybe. Maybe. No, I like Kilvin a lot. You see a lot of quoth in Kilvin, in that dogged pursuit of something. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. It, yeah, that's quoth to a T, and that's also Kilvin. Yeah, um, an example of that is the the ever burning lamps. Yeah, thing, which at his admissions, I don't know if you remember, but that's the question he gets from Kilvin: is how oh. would you do an ever burning lamp? They bring uh-huh. it up a little bit in this right, chapter. Yeah. He's like, one is the one you you stumbled upon it, and it was pretty good. It was a good one for me, but not the best. Um, but it makes having having this story now makes me look back at that admissions chapter and just and gives it puts it in a whole new context it's it's almost like i imagine all the masters in the lunchroom or whatever and kilvin just never shuts up about these damn lamps and so like <laughs> even during admissions he's got to ask the students about these he damn lamps and, and, he, the, and the other masters are just just like, like oh, oh my god again with the lamps and his his response in admissions is it's, it's my question. I'll ask about the lamps. <laughs> it just adds, it adds comedy to the scene that we read chapters ago that we didn't get the joke then, but now, but now right. you're. Oh, like, I see. Oh, I get this it. His whole life. It's yeah. all he does. His lovelies. Yeah. His lovelies. <laughs> and the master's probably all like, I'm sure he's got friends and they like him or whatever, but like they're all sick of hearing about the damn lamps. Mm hmm. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, and it's never <laughs> enough. And it's never enough. Dude, you, it's, you got a candle burning for 70 days, and mm-hmm. it's never enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like the Monty Python guys bringing up the swallows all the time. Just want to let it go with the coconut and the swallows. <laughs> Hmm. He also says to quote uh, regarding his being whipped, don't worry over such small things. Which, again, you kind of compared the two, quote, quote, and, and Kilvin. And I mean, I think that's kind of how quote thinks about it too. He's like, all right, well, this is something I get through. And then uh, on to said, the next thing. He said to the yeah. chancellor, I imagine I'll heal. Right. You know, on to the next thing. Don't don't worry about it. Yeah. And Kil- Kilvin that in that chapter was like, come see me the next hour at, right after you've been whipped. 
And he's like, actually, I'm I don't know if you heard what just was said, but yeah. Exactly. I have other things going on at that time. Uh, yeah. The fishery doesn't sound like a bad life though. Like if you're good at it and you can like make things, and then basically it sounds like people go sell them and then like you get money. Probably. It's like it's like the I don't know, it's like the business. It's it's the, the business college of, of the university, maybe, right? The trades, yeah, yeah. or something. Yeah. 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 But also a form of artistic expression, you know. Yes. Yeah. Glass blowing and things like that. Yes. So yeah. It's a pretty cool place. Uh but one where you're using your hands still. You're working, right? Yeah. The fishery is, yeah, I, I really like the idea of it. Mm-hmm. If you I were challenge all, yourself, if I were at all good with my hands, it sounds like a nice kind of thing. You know? Yep. But I'm not good with my hands. <laughs> it might be better than you think. I'm good at typing on a keyboard. Hey, automatically typing. On a keyboard. We do get another little fun story about. They're talking about hitching your wagon to one of them when, when Savoy threatened one of them with his riding crop. Which again is just a nice little it's just a nice little moment of camaraderie amongst the friends, right? And they just are like, yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah. And they're just laughing with him. And it's just a good, good little human moment from Pat again. Yep. I mean, I hate to sound super crass, but maybe good friends are the ones that pick up the tip when your buddy sexually assaults a waitress. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I misread that the first time I I read it. I thought she was saying that Will had done that to her Mm. um, and not Subway. Mm -hmm. When they make excuses for him and excuses are not good enough. But yeah, the tip apparently is enough to, to calm her down about it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my heavens. Okay. Yep. But that's Kilvin. I like him. Again, that dogged pursuit of whatever yep. probably leads to these guys being as great as they are. Yeah. And I'm very much a that's good enough type guy. <laughs> I'm totally a <laughs> yes, that's definitely. fine. Yeah, yeah that's, this is fine. Will it hold? <laughs> then we're done. Then we're done here. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Kilvin is, uh, he's considering Kilvin, he's considering Elodin, and they're very different, right? You know, Kilvin is a worker, right? He's going to work and put the time in and the effort and the sweat. And Elodin's just kind of airy and just kind of wandering. He just wanders around looking at trees and like studying things with his eyes, very casual. Right, very different people. And right. And you get the impression at the end of this chapter that you know, yeah, he hasn't really given up on on the idea of oh, uh, not at all. Right? Yeah. Like that's where all this stuff is interesting and hitch my wagon to Kilvin because he's cool and good, but and we the, click. Yeah. We got Kilvin's the name of the, the wind route. over here mm-hmm. that is, you know, tantalizing me. The it's the same, it's the same thing back in those early chapters, learning under Abanthi. Yeah. It gets the sympathy thing going and it's like, yeah. wow, fine, whatever. Yeah. But I want to learn to speak the name of the wind. Yeah. Sigildry right. now is the new sympathy. And it's it still can't hold his attention over over naming mm-hmm. uh, over the real magic, the true magic. Mm. What do you think of the, the crockery in this uh built to keep Arcanus in? Yeah, is that another safeguard against burning arcanists? feels like it yeah it feels like if they notice them going going south they're like well there are responsible we empowered them there are responsibility we got to keep them or they'll yeah. go out and make trouble for all of us it also just shows how tenuous of a practice arcany is right yeah. that we have to build a whole facility to house these people that where things go south for them when yeah. things go south for them yeah yeah, it feels like there's some real risk. It sounded like, uh, well, I think they said there's a couple every term that crack, <laughs> and um, you know, there's that the university is 
not that big. Uh, it's like 1,500 people, I think. Um, so like two out of 1,500 is... That need to be institutionalized. <laughs> yeah, that's every something. Every semester. <laughs> it's something. Four years. Yeah, it's <laughs> not great. <laughs> but I, you know, they, they kind of say, I think Will and Sim, maybe some will always say, you know, it could be one of us next semester. It sounds like it could almost happen at any point. Whereas I would think it would only happen when you were really kind of reaching, reaching for the higher level, you know, answers of the universe kind of stuff. But it sounds like it's almost like burnout. Sure. It's, but it's not related to the, the stuff you're studying necessarily. It's related to how tired and burned out you are. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so I don't know. Which goes back to the, our question about how well are they really taking care of these students? You yeah. Know? What's the campus healthcare like? Right. Yeah. They're investing in the university. The, how are you investing back into them? You got the bowl of condoms out? Or uh, you probably didn't have that at your. That was the big thing at BYU. That was the big thing at BYU. That was a big thing at U of A, where mostly <laughs> we were known for selling short shorts that girls could wear that had U on one butt cheek and A on the other. And they were they were the in thing. I think when I was there, the dorm next to mine was revealed by Playboy to be the most sexually active dorm in the country. Nice. Yeah. Just missed it by that much, Scad. Just by that just much. you know you know I'm one dorm sure I... over. And I'm not sure I was what different. they were looking for, even in the most sexually active <laughs> dorm in the country. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I like both. I'm not sure I would know. fit in. You'll no. never know. But uh, campus health stocked with condoms for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. And you got anything else then for this chapter before we move on in that? No, let's get to uh, our final chapter, the interlude. Chapter 45 interlude. Some tavern tale. Those were probably the first stories ever told about me both mused as Chronicler embraced a break. Fast asks why he didn't just go find Scarpy. Both gives a logical reason, but the other reason he gives is more interesting. Both wasn't living in a story. Stories all follow a pattern. The young hero seeks revenge for a tragedy in his or her life, seeks advice from some unlikely source, a wise shaman or a hermit in the woods or a drunken swordsman. The hero proves themselves worthy, gain access to great powers and knowledge. Then they find the villains and kill them. This is the same rough pattern you hear in every tavern tale, according to Cloth. And while it would be entertaining, it isn't the truth. One part of that truth is that he was still not over his tragedy at the time of the university. His pain and sadness held him in their grasp still. The memories of the blood and burning hair from his family getting murdered were still etched in his mind. While he was committed to some vengeance, he was still really coming to grips with his tragedy. Further, a boy's got to eat. He had very real world challenges to overcome just to stay alive. You can only devote so much of your time to uncovering the world's mysteries when you were fighting poverty and station challenges every step of your life. He had more to contend with than just the Chandrian. But for all that, he did find his hermit in the woods to contend with the Chandrian, and he was chasing the name of the wind to defeat them. So parts of the story line up. That's it for that chapter. Yeah, I like that. I was living in a story that's Rothfuss uh bringing into his crosshairs you know all those tropes and all those authors that may be right within them um here he is taking a little shot and I love that but the great the great irony here to me is that he's taking a shot at himself Mm -hmm. because he is (laughs) the tavern tale he's telling is greatly entertaining and actually it does seem to be following a lot of these elements they're they're just things happening kind of in between also which probably most people leave out of the exciting tavern tales and some of those tropey things that you're referring to but even though quote is saying i wasn't living in a story we are living in his story right now and it is following a lot of these patterns and it's very much He's presenting it as a story, as we mentioned before. Yeah. He, yeah. this isn't a journal that you know the chronicler is going to find some time later, where you know he wrote it down for himself and never intended for anyone to find it. 
Kvoth is very pointedly presenting the tale the way he wants to present it. Yes. And that's as a story. A story. Yeah. And and not and not the truth. He he keeps harping on, well, it's not the truth. We, we've already been told. He's not necessarily hewing to the truth. Not at all cases anyway, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's interesting. How how old do you think Chronicle is? I don't you know. know that? I never thought about that. I always kind of pictured him to be kind of like. I don't picture him as being old. Yeah. yeah, Late thirties, early forties, kind of like us. Maybe he's a guy that's out traveling around and stuff. Yeah. Thirties, forties. Yeah. Yeah. It's just interesting. Like, was he just missing whenever Quoth was at the university? Like they never ran into each other. I mean, he's out doing. Maybe he's out chronicling. Yeah. Yeah. Collecting stories. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just not there during Quoth's first term, at least. Yeah. Interesting. And just to go back to our conversation about vengeance, you know, Quoth shrugged. There was more to my life than revenge. <laughs> you know, well, we're seeing well, it quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's other parts of your life, <laughs> yes, but you know, revenge is a big part of it. It's almost like he he doesn't even notice it. He thinks of his revenge as just against the Chandrian and. Yeah. It's almost like he, it's not even a conscious thought for him of how he employs it against anyone who does him wrong. He really might have a blind spot about it. Sure. He might think of it as like self-defense. Yeah, exactly. This Something is my way of like, protecting myself. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think we can see it more clearly than that, right? Sure. Looking at it from, from outside in, but yeah. Yep. Interesting. Um. I don't actually have a ton with this section. I think it's, uh, I think it's it's meant to. I think it's meant to poke fun, like you said, at some other storytellers, but also even at himself, mm-hmm. um, and to realize that, that to, again, to poke the bear on you know it, him being an unreliable narrator. Your story is a tale, and, and you aren't telling the truth. And a lot of these elements you're talking about are in this story, right? And Anyway, you think Rothfuss is is doing that intentionally? He's intentionally keeping us in a sense of unease about Quoth and the veracity of what he's saying. Do you think Rothfuss is doing that intentionally? I don't know. I, I don't he's know. just such we, a clever writer. We've talked about this a lot with with our coverage of Song of Ice and Fire. I'm not. I'm not actually, I'm not a, a super perceptive reader my first time through for sure. Yeah. Even my second time through, I, I feel like, you know, and, and we talked about it too a lot with, um, with, with Grant series. Um, uh, I'll be erased. What was Grant series that we covered? Uh, Riot at Yorkville. Right. Yeah. I can so, name the names yes. of the books. Yeah. 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 I can't remember. The, uh, I am, uh, Mercury. My Mercury. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I think it takes conversations with you, with other people for sure to like really get to some of these ideas. Right. And I definitely didn't think of Quoth as a, as a, you know, an an unreliable narrator. I didn't think of him as deliberately lying, you know, about the story he's telling. I didn't think of the fact that it's even just because no one can challenge it, that we're getting a, a view that might not be accurate, even though he's trying to be accurate. Right. Right. Yep. Uh, I didn't think about those things the first time through. I barely thought about them the second time through. The third time through, it was a lot more, a lot more present on my mind. Uh, and then talking with you brings it, brings it all out. Right. Sure. So yeah. That was a really long way to say, I think probably he's doing it on purpose. I'm not sure everyone picks up on it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What do you um, think? I think he does. I think he's that clever. Yeah. You just see all the other cleverness that he injects into his writing and you just see it. I have, yeah. I love him. He's a great writer. Yeah. Just great. It really is. Yeah. Well, there's a reason I call this my favorite book lots of times. It's a good one. Yep. Do you have anything else for this section or do we one. move, do we move to Debbie after dark? Uh, let's go to Debbie. All right. After dark. 
Okay. Okay. You want to talk so, about the, the 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 door and get right into it? Do you want to talk about the hermit in the woods? Where do you want to go? You know, let's just go right to the door. Okay. And then, depending on how we feel after that, we can go we can further. Go, go to other things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what do you think? You have you have thoughts? Um. So the third book is to be called The Doors of Stone. The Doors of Stone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, is it is it an opening of knowledge? Is it a way of traveling? Um, you know, are there other doors like this, in other words? Uh, and what does that mean for the story? Um, yeah. I don't have a ton of thoughts on it. I'm, you know, I've told you before, and I've said this on the air before, that I'm becoming one of those readers that maybe doesn't challenge himself (laughs) enough. I'm willing to just let what happens come to me when the author feeds it to me. Yeah. So I honestly don't have a ton of thoughts about it. I've definitely become more that way with the Song of Ice and Fire, you know, partially just out of, we've been through those books so much, Matt, but, but partially just out of like i'm tired ty- i'm tired of talking about it or we talked about them to death <laughs> i have more tolerance for doing it now because we talked about it less that's probably really the only reason mm-hmm. um there's so there's a lot about stone doors so stone doors they in the in one of the uh in the, in the story of the creation war they seal supposedly they seal ajax behind a door of stone um and so you come to a door like this that is very much you know Cliff says uh, it's a door that's meant to be meant to meant to be closed not opened mm-hmm. right um and so you wonder what's what's behind it right is it is it is it sealing something away we know that you know you mentioned plural doors of stone so, so we have that door that sealed i actually could that be this door maybe Maybe it could be. Um, mm, what's we, hiding behind it? We know that. You no, know, do we know it? It's a. It's a pretty commonly accepted. If it's not known, I have to go look now. Crap. It's a pretty commonly accepted truth that transfer tra- uh, traveling between the Fey realm and this realm is done through. Fr- basically, through the the gray stones, right? So they're essentially. They're essentially doors of stone. You enter through them to go to get to the Feywild. You can only do it, you know, at certain times when the moon is in certain places or things like that. Um, I don't think we know exactly how it works, but it's pretty commonly known or speculated, at least that that's. But the the the, the gray stones are gateways, right? Which would be doors of stone. So it could be a matter of of um, of theories. Um, you know, that maybe, maybe through all this poking, you know, through this revenge, you know, that both is actually going to spring Ajax out of his door of stone, right? And that that's what the title means. Doors of stone is, both figures it out and through his poking at the Chandra and actually lets Ajax loose, right? And that's what he's so, that's what he's, you know, so down on himself about at the tavern is that he's done all these things. It's his fault, right? He said he says that very early on in his book that, you know, he's at fault for this. His sword is named Folly, right? Um, what what Folly did he, you know, did he, did he unveil and how? So there's theories like that about, you know, the name of the title being relating to that. Uh, one thing on the wiki says that maybe this specific door um, is a door to part of the Urgan Empire. The Urgan Empire was the empire that the creation war destroyed. So there were, remember there were like the eight cities or whatever, and they all yeah. fell but one. What one? The, the Urgan Empire was supposedly like the greatest empire that this Temerant, the continent, has ever seen, right? One united emperor empire with those eight cities. And we know uh that when we finally get down into the under thing with our with Auri later. 
the Ari shows him essentially a a hidden city. There's all sorts of ducts and pipes and mm. rooms and all sorts of things under there. And so yeah. mm-hmm. and and we know too, if you remember from reading it the first time, that both finds a way from up from from down in the under thing up into the archives. And um and specifically back to that door, not through the door, not not in that room, but can kind of get to the door easily from where he emerges from the uh, from the under thing. Um, so yeah, one one theory is that it's a door to down into this, you know, into the under thing, into this old civilization. Maybe there are secrets in there. Um, I also thought maybe that, that, that it's mostly just a metaphor. Um, both himself spends his whole young adult life pursuing the chantry, or at least we think he does. Um, they are locked behind a metaphorical stone door that he's desperate to open, just like this one, right? He's he's immediately distracted by this door, and that's a metaphor for his whole life, just being distracted by secrets and the unknown and all this stuff that he wants to uncover. Where if he just if he just sat back, you know, and picked a life of relative ease, but certainly fame and fortune and everything else that he would want. If you pick something else, you know, maybe it would be better off, i.e., you know, the secrets behind the door are not worth are not worth the finding of them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So there's that. Um, the the word. Mm. Go ahead. You got something? Oh, not really. Just I've been your, rambling for a while. Just to your point. <laughs> I like listening to your thoughts on this stuff. You certainly, you know, you've gone farther in these books than I have, and I love listening to your thoughts on it. Um, The life that you are saying that he should perhaps focus on is the life that Kilvin offers him, right? Mm -hmm. Even though Kilvin's always pushing for more, he's found to do, he's doing it in a way that's that's actually, you know, maybe it annoys the other masters like we laughed about, but he's making he's money still pursuing he, something yeah, yeah he's, and he's yeah. doing it within you know pursuing something that's not dangerous to humanity maybe or <laughs> yeah it isn't gonna kill anybody he just wants to make a lamp that burns forever and don't we all <laughs> and it's almost like the quote that we see in these interludes is the quote that's trying his darndest to now do that because mm-hmm. of the regret, like you said, that he maybe feels because of what he did. Yeah. And I love that thought. And it's like, I really screwed up my dogged determination to seek more led to some real consequences that not just don't just affect me, but maybe the world at large or at least a larger group. And so I have to fight against that urge that I have. Yeah. And go the complete yeah. opposite way let run it in yes let let the stone door stay closed um mikey i think maybe god put that rock there for a reason and um <laughs> maybe we shouldn't move it right <laughs> okay you goonie like, andy you goonie <laughs> yeah um i mean i don't know i don't know that i ascribe to it but it's it's a thought i have that you know i think it the, fits the this this stone door at least is really a metaphor he admits mm-hmm. right away that despite having everything he always wanted around him, the knowledge of the entire world around him, he's distracted by this fucking secret of a door. Forget the door, man. Go read your books. You've been wanting to get in here forever. Focus on what's right in front of you. What's that? Right? On? It's on Twister. He says that. Bill Paxton's character. Bill Paxton. Focus on what's right in front of you. Me, Joe. Me. He says that to Helen Hunt. I can hear him saying it. Right? Yeah. Because she's always pursuing yes. the tornado, right? Yes, that's right. Focus that's right. on rights, what's right in front of you. Yeah. There's also uh, two more just things that could be said about this door specifically. The word says, the word Valeritas is written on it. We don't really know. what It's not a real word. We don't know what it means. Fela does tell him later that she had a dream about the door. And that behind it was the tomb of a dead king named Valeritas. 
which is maybe interesting. Yeah. Um, this book is called the King Killer Chronicle. Um, maybe Valeritas is sealed up. Maybe that is in fact Ajax as well. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe Valeritas oh is God, sealed up Ajax. in his tomb and and he he's the king that you know he ends up killing. I don't know. Um, all these are, you know, there's no evidence for it or anything, but there are suppositions. And also the kind of a couple of the last things we have on this door, um, for sure, Alodin kind of kind of dismisses it. And he might be doing that to to put both on the wrong path, but he kind of says, Oh, that door. I remember being so frustrated not knowing what was behind that door. No, you don't get to look. But he's kind of kind of given the attitude of like, don't worry about it. It's not important. You don't need to, don't worry about it. But puppet. Im- seems to imply that it is important and that you shouldn't worry about it because it's important, right? Everyone's saying don't worry about it, but Puppet says it's it's important and meaningful, but we don't get much else. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we don't know about the door, but there's a lot of interesting thoughts out there. Um, you know, I guess maybe the most mundane is, yeah, it's just a door to the city down below. Uh, and they sealed it up because they don't want, you know, who knows who knows why. The, the masters don't want people asking a bunch of questions about the creation war, or the church doesn't, or something like that, maybe. So they seal that city up and hope nobody ever finds it. But guess what? If you stumble into the wrong courtyard, you can just go in there like Ari lives in it. So, you know, like how hard did they really try to cover it up? Yep, it's something big. It's definitely something big. It feels big. Yep. It could be a red herring, but it feels it feels big. Mm-hmm. It's like you said, it's the only part of the entire archive that's not covered in books. This one, you know, stone wall or whatever with the door. So and interesting big. they put it in a place that is in pitch black, right? That requires Yeah. But but still like if they really wanted to hide it and not have anyone see it, they could have built something around it that you couldn't get into. Put books in front of it. Right. You know, something. For Pete's sakes. But like anybody that gets into the Arcanum can just walk up and study this thing. So you know, maybe they want it to be studied. Maybe they're looking for the right guy to come and open it. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe some people are and some people aren't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It goes back to Lauren, right? Like what is his motivation with with being where he is? And yeah. I proposed in a previous episode that maybe he's one of the Amir. Um, or something um you know and that he's got some sort of job to do with protecting this knowledge or even making sure people don't get it right um which is why he discouraged the research of the chandrian um you know so it all feels tied together somehow to me but yep. a Elodin, Elodin's hard to trust but he's you know he's like yeah it's, not, it's nothing don't worry about it implying that he does know Right. Yeah. But, um, I like the metaphor idea. Um, I like the idea that maybe this door or one like it will will release Ajax onto the world. Um, the Chandrian are, if you remember, kind of theoretically maybe almost like agents of Ajax, right? Aliax, um, we talked about before being maybe like the breath of Ajax. Like Ajax breathed life almost into him. Right. Um, anyway, fun stuff with the door. Don't Leave know it a closed. lot. Yeah. Don't don't know a lot, but uh, kind of cool stuff there. Mm-hmm. It also uh, it does feel like the the Lactus <clears throat> box, which we haven't seen yet. It's in Wise Man's Sphere, and the box at the foot of Quoth's bed. Right. Also, kind of like no hinges, flat surfaces. Can't find a purchase. Right. Similar in those ways too. Um, we know that both is uh, one of his, his nicknames is something like um, the lock breaker or something like. So supposedly no lock keep him out, right? Hmm. So we'll see. Yeah. Uh, what else you got? Uh, you know, most there's not a ton more in these chapters 
Um, obviously, we're introduced more to Elodin, and I'm interested in just the connection, the really obvious in my mind initial connection that Rothfuss makes to Quoth, talking about you know his early entrance into the university and how he progressed so quickly. And this just goes along with everything we've kind of been talking about in Debbie After Dark. Is this some sort of cautionary tale to Quoth, saying that if you push too hard, you're going to crack, you know? Yeah. You see some of these, I don't know, this is probably not fair, child actors and everything that push too hard too fast. You see it with musicians too, performers, those in the public spotlight, and it burns them out you know, or yeah. it gets to a cracking point, a breaking point. Right. Um, and if this is kind of saying to quote, hold up, hold up. Yeah. I, I think, I think we're meant to see it. I think we're also meant to see that he doesn't see it that way. Yeah. Right? Like, and you, I, should, like, you probably shouldn't expect him to. Well, I don't, it's, you know, seeing those kinds of things about yourself can be hard. Yeah, but absolutely. Yeah, that's what I mean. And we all, you know, to some degree think we're invincible somehow, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that won't like, well, be me. It won't happen to me. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. But I think, I, yeah, it does feel like Pat's trying to tell us that, you know, that this is a possibility. And that, and, and, and to tell us something about Quoth that he doesn't see it, right? Um, but, yeah, I think, I, I think he is meant to be a cautionary tale for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I had one more thing, I guess. Um, who is the mad hermit in the woods that Quoth finds? Um, so at the very end, it's like one of the last sentences we've got, uh, in the, in the tavern chapter here. Yeah. Uh, I did find something very near to the mad hermit in the woods, and I was determined to learn the name of the wind. Um, and I, I kind of, this was one of the things that I came to kind of as, right as I was finished with prepare, preparing for this episode and coming back to the idea that like, he doesn't feel like we're in a story, right? That we're, this is life and the, it's not, the story isn't the truth, but um, what he has is not one hermit in the woods. He has lots. And that's the way most of these stories actually go. You don't find one guy that teaches you everything. It's not usually really a Mr. Miyagi that teaches you all the things you know about life and karate to, to win all your battles and end at life, right? It's like both goes through and he picks up all these different things. You know, Loden is one, likely, right? Um, most of these hero tales are simplifying the path. It would just be a Loden maybe in those stories. But he picks things up from Scarpy, from the, the story, right? He gets knowledge from that story. To teach him that the Chandri and maybe are the enemy to, to wake his brain up. He learns swordsmanship from the Adamera in, in the in the wise man's fear. He learns lovemaking from Valurian in the Fey Realm. He learns maybe detrimentally from the Fey in the in the Fey Realm. He gets connections and social standing from one of his contacts, Breden, uh, who he plays tack with uh, in the next book. He's proving himself to each of these people and gaining skills and knowledge from them that he will need to finish his end goal, right? But it is this same hero's journey. It's just that he's got multiple stops and multiple people along the way, right? And, you know, it he does seem to almost stumble into them sometimes, right. but, but he's still going through this journey. It's just that it's more than one stop, right? But eventually all of this stuff, the knowledge, the sword fighting, the skills, the magic, he's going to need all of it to, you know, release Ajax or kill a king or an angel or whatever it is that he's going to end up doing. He's going to need all of these things that he's learned from these various places. And uh, so his Matt Hermit in the woods is lots of Matt Hermits in the woods. It's an interesting like, concept. I love that. I, you know, the obvious first thought is, oh, it's Elodin, you know, especially yeah. with that line that you're saying, I was determined to learn the name of the wind. Like, yeah, it's Elodin. But uh, you're absolutely right. It's, it's multiple people. And often we don't recognize that when it's happening. It's only when we look back years yeah. later yeah. that we go, oh, so-and-so so did this. The Wayne's World thing. Yeah. 
It's a good thing we were there to hear that information. It seemed extraneous at the time. <laughs> oh, R.I.P. Chris Farley. Yeah. Um, but that's what happens. You know, it's not as specifically laid out as it is for Luke Skywalker with Ben Kenobi and then mm-hmm. Yoda and so on. But, uh, you know, certainly things Luke learned from Uncle Owen yeah. informed who he was. And he right. probably learned later to attribute those to him and so right. on. Um, yes. Yeah, so and that's, that's not really exciting. Concept. Right. It's so not, it's not so sexy. stories leave yeah. it out sometimes. Right. Mm-hmm. But it's still, it really is the, the tavern tale is just more complicated than we tell it. Right. But, sure. But it's still kind of the same. Right. Mm-hmm. And Quoth is living it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's all I got. Good point. I love it. Cool. You ready to sign off? I'm ready to sign off. I'm calling an audible on my sign off. Okay. Which feels a little unfair because it's hearkening back to a lyric that I've, I think was just in the last episode, but oh, it fits so well with what we've (laughs) talked about today. I got it. I haven't used it as sign off, but I brought it up. Okay. It's from that darn new Dave Matthews band album that I keep going back to, buddy. Yeah. Looking for a vein is the name of the song. I thought it was a song about drug use and it's not vain in terms of mining. Yep. Dave Matthews, a songster, right? Down in this hole again. I should start this off saying this is Matt signing off. Quoting Dave Matthews. I'm down in this hole again, trying to find a vein of something, hammering these walls and hoping, hoping to find my way through. But what if I strike it? Rich as I want to be, will it set me free or be just another hole to dig? Hmm. What will it mean? What will it mean? What will it be? What does it matter? But I can't give up on this. Always trying to break on through. The air is choking me, but hammering's all I know to do. Mm -hmm. That's not all the lyrics, but those are the ones that I'll share. Finding those secrets is close. Looks vain. Mm-hmm. Uh, Scott signing off with a different type of vein. I'm vain enough to quote myself. Uh, <laughs> my sign off. If your day is too full, go home. Stop doing stuff. Be willing and able to recognize when you've had enough of a day. And just stop. Just stop trying to do stuff. That's it. I'll try, okay? <laughs> Yes, it was directed directly at you. Good advice. Good advice. Thanks, Kalasar, for listening. Yes. Good night. We're recording. Welcome, everyone. <laughs>